Big Red's march to an undefeated season was halted last week by Brown in the Bears' 16-3 upset at Shilkoff Field. Key injuries to Per Larson, Matt Schulman, and Ned Burke didn't help the Big Red cause. And costly fumbles and interceptions by Cornell enabled the Bears to score their first win in the rivalry since 1989. Today, Cornell takes on the struggling Yale Bulldogs and their ageless coach, Carm Coza, now in his 30th season. But last Saturday, Yale turned in a solid performance in a 14-6 loss to undefeated Penn. The Bulldogs will showcase their captain and all-Ivy performer Carl Ritchie, who leads the nation's linebackers in interceptions. Coming up, Cornell hopes to stay in the hunt for the Ivy League championship. continues this afternoon it's the 57th renewal of Yale and Cornell in Ivy League football action hello again everyone I'm Bruce Beck welcome to 1994 Cornell Big Red football well a couple of weeks ago Cornell looked at this football game as just a roadblock in their quest for the Ivy League championship but now things are mighty different after losing last week to Brown and with two tough games still to play against Pennsylvania and Columbia. Now when you think about the Ivy League standings right now, Penn is on top with Cornell one game back while Princeton, Columbia and Harvard all remain in the hunt. This is a must win football game for the Cornell Big Red. And earlier today, I asked Big Red coach Jim Hoffer how Cornell approaches the 1994 stretch drive. Well, we're, uh, we're one game behind what we would have chosen to be if we could be 4-0 uh, rather than 3-1. Uh, but with the way our schedule plays out in November, um, everything is still up to whatever this football team wants it to be. Uh, we have an opportunity to still play the team that's in the lead uh, at the end of the year. Uh, but we have, we have a really critical ball game against Yale to play. On that note, let me bring in my broadcast partner, Kevin Guthrie. And Kevin, it is stay with the basics for Cornell today. That means smash mouth football. Well, that's what they've done all year. Of course, last week it didn't work out so well for him. Brown played a great football game against him, beat him up in every phase of the game, especially up front on the offensive and defensive line of scrimmage. So Cornell wants to come into this ball game and dominate the line of scrimmage. You see up front, in the trenches, Cornell has a big advantage. They average 273 yards a man to Yale's 238, nearly 40, yards, 40 pounds per guy. And the guy who's going to take advantage of that weight advantage is Chad Levitt, number 33, the tailback. He comes into this football game leading the Ivy League. He's got almost 1,000 yards. He needs just 58 yards to get 1,000 yards. He's chasing a lot of Ed Marinero's records. Right now at Yale University, the playing of our national anthem by the Yale University Precision Marching Band.
Well, the Yale Bulldogs opened the season with a record of 3-0, including a quality win over UConn, but since that time they have lost four in a row. They are coached by the legendary Carm Coza, now in his 30th year as the skipper at Yale. He has 172 wins, 12th among active coaches in Division I. And Kevin, when you talk about Yale football, you talk about tradition, you talk about Coza. Well, you do. I mean, what a, what a fantastic and great coach. He's been there 30 years. He's had so many great players come through this program. You know, this is heresy for a guy who played at Princeton, but you know, even playing at Princeton, I remember thinking, what would it have been like to play for that guy? You know, he's just... He's a legend in the Ivy League. He's really a legend uh, across college football. You know, embodying the Yale tradition on the field today, though, is number 59, mid-side linebacker Carl Ritchie. He is the kind of player, he's only 200 pounds, very active, very good against the run. You know, he's got 31 more tackles than any other yeah. Yale defender. But he's not just good against the Three. run. He also has five interceptions. He leads the nation among linebackers with those five interceptions. So Carl Ritchie, number 59, is going to be tackling number 33, Chad Levin, a lot today. It is week number eight in the Ivy League. League, and this is a big day of football. Three other games will keep you posted throughout the day as far as scores are concerned. Brown is at Harvard, Columbia at Dartmouth, and the big one, folks, Penn at Princeton. But coming up, it's Yale versus Cornell on a beautiful day at the Yale Bowl. Opening kickoff is just ahead. Yale has won the toss. They have elected to receive Tim McDermott kicking off in a fair catch ball for at the 33-yard line by the Yale Bulldogs by Joe Leith. They put it in play first and 10. Well, the quarterback of Yale is Chris Hetherington, a multi-dimensional ball player. We asked Coach Jim Hopper about stopping Hetherington. Well, I think he's a dangerous football player, and he's a dangerous playmaker. He is bigger than most of our defensive players. He's a strong runner. Sometimes I think they, they almost prefer the thing to break down uh, so that he can run around and try to make things happen because they've gotten a bunch of big plays, either by runs or by passes completed uh, because of the way that Chris has played. He's a much improved passer as a quarterback, and uh, uh, he's really a, a dynamic football player and one that we have to have our full attention on the entire game. And on the first play from scrimmage, Hetherington is picked off by Chris Hansen, his seventh interception of the year, and Cornell takes over at their own 43-yard line, first and 10, with Carol Larson at quarterback and Chad Levitt as the tailback. And on first down, the handoff is to Levitt, and Chad gets up near the 50-yard line. It'll bring up a second down and four, the tackle made by Dave Gorsica. Here's the offensive group for the big red of Cornell Larson, although he had a knee injury, is back at quarterback. Levitt and Ingham start to pull back, replacing Ned Burke, who was injured last week. Shulman and Berryman are the receivers, and the offensive line, big, active, and quick for their side. And you can see the weights right there. Gilkinson, 285. Blade door is 282. Second down and four. Larson back to throw. Fires for Berryman. He has it complete at the 35-yard line of Yale. Good for a Cornell first down. All right, here's a look at the Yale defensive group, a four-man front. Jeff Stone and Bob Greenlee are the ends. Gorsica and Likaretsis are the tackles. Likaretsis coming back from a slight shoulder separation. Linebackers led by all Ivy, Carl Ritchie, and the secondary very good. One W roll wrap with three M's, Mellis, Mazorkowitz, and Masella. First and ten for Cornell. Chad Levin gets the handoff. Levin with a big hole. Gets eight, nine yards. It took a couple of players to knock him down. And Levin close to another first down. Tackle made by Michael Kopcha. And it is a first down for the Big Red at the 24-yard line. So Cornell coming out of the gate quickly. They are. You know, so far in the first in the first drive, they've not run any double tight stuff. And we talked coming into the game as if they were going to play smash mouth football. They've mixed it up. They've thrown the ball. Their formations are very spread out. They're using three wide receivers. And they're testing Yale, trying to spread Yale's defense out across the field. First and 10 at the 24. Larson, quick drop back, looking for Perryman. He's got him out there. Touchdown! It was quick, and the big red on the scoreboard first with just 13.41 in the first quarter of play, and Aaron Berryman catching the touchdown on a little loop pass from Pear Larson. Just a fade down the 
goal line, and they caught Yale in a blitz and man-to-man -man coverage, and that turned into a touchdown for Cornell as Barryman just went up the sideline. I can't ha emphasize enough what a great throw that was by Pear Larson because he did a great job of leading Barryman into the end zone and getting him to score. Barryman's third touchdown catch of the season, and now on for the extra point is John Roden with Tim McDermott to hold Cornell off of that odd shift for their one after touchdown attempt. Ball plays down, kick is up, and the kick is good, and Cornell off the interception by Hanson now leads seven to nothing. Do you see the beginning of the play here? Just a straight drop back, three-step drop. There's a blitz on by Yale. You see the linebackers penetrating, man-to-man -man coverage down the field, and just a great throw. Watch the pass lead Berryman into the end zone. Perfectly in stride, great throw, and an easy score for Cornell. So the big red up, seven to nothing. First quarter of play from the Yale ball. We'll be right back. the interception striking quickly bearing me with the touchdown catch remember he had the game winner against Dartmouth dropping back deep for Yale Dan Iwan and Rob Masella Iwan number three Masella 14 and kicking off is John Rose and it's another short kick that goes out of bounds flag down ball went out at the 26 yard line and Kevin really, Yale is not in a position right off the gun to make an error. They felt they could not afford to commit a turnover, especially early. Yeah, they couldn't afford to have that right off the bat. And, and Chris Hetherington got pressure immediately and, and was forced to throw off his back foot and just threw a high ball right into the middle of the field. Chris Hansen turned it into an interception. So on the penalty, Yale takes over at their own 35-yard line. Their quarterback, Chris Hetherington, and their tailback is Keith Price, a very good one coming off a couple of knee operations. The wideouts are Aram and also Iowa. Here's their offensive line. Jay Sturhan, their center, has been their toad of the week five times. We'll talk more about that later. On first down, it's a straight handoff. Keith Price, and he goes nowhere. Good pursuit by Dick Emmett and Garrett Gardy. And Emmett missed last week's ball game with an injury, but he is back. Cornell defensive group this week with Emmett back on that line. Bus on the other side. Kane and Woods are the tackle. A change at linebacker with Kevin Maney starting instead of John Wagner. And a secondary with Hanson already picking off an interception. Garrett Gardy has been sensational in recent weeks. So for Yale, it is second down and 10. Ball at their own 35. Cornell leading 7-0 in this first quarter of play and a timeout taken by the Yale Bulldogs here in the first quarter. A little early, but Hedrington wants to talk things over with Carm Koza. So we'll take a short break at the Yale Bowl with Cornell leading 7-0. We'll be back in a moment. a good look at handsome Dan the 14th born last Mother's Day in North Carolina his first year as a mascot he succeeds Dan the 13th there he is <laughs> what a great tradition yell at the football on their own 35 second down and 10 Edrington the quarterback single set back behind him and the handoff goes to Price and he is met at the line of scrimmage and dropped immediately and it brings up a third down and long and Dick Emmett very active coming back from the one week off. Yeah, he's, he, he's, he's eager to play obviously, you know, a guy, the captain, the fifth year senior, he wants to be on the football field, he was out a couple weeks with that knee, he's back with a vengeance. Strange handoff in the backfield, Chris Hetherington and, and uh, Price had some kind of mix-up, it wasn't a good handoff to play with Chris Hetherington. So it's third down and about eight yards to go, twins to the right side of the field for the Bulldogs, and now in motion goes Jesse Steinfeld. Hetherington rolls right, he throws for Steinfeld, it's complete, but short of a first down, up at the 43, Steinfeld, the junior from Green Bay, Wisconsin, comes off a very good week against Penn last week, seven catches, 100 yards, he was named to the Ivy League honor roll. Steinfeld, you said, had a great week last week, what they tried to do there was get him in the flat and let him run for the first down, but the pass was just too short, and they came up three or four yards short. Jay Waller back in punt formation at his own 28-yard line. He's averaging 36 yards per kick this year. And Waller gets it away. Chris Allen has it for Cornell back at the 22, and he is dropped at the 27. Good coverage by the Bulldogs. 
and you come back to Hanson Dan here for a minute. Hanson Dan, the 14th that we saw down on the sideline for Yale, uh, replaced Hanson Dan 13. The owner of Hanson Dan 13 said that the, that the job was too strenuous, and that they had to retire, <laughs> retire the, the little guy, and, and number 14 comes in. You see Perry Larson, Perry Larson with an excellent first drive. You see his numbers for the season. He had a great first drive. Cornell was glad to have him back from the knee injury he had last week. Just the second in the league in pass percentage. And on first down, he heads to Chad Levitt. And Levitt continues to close in on 1,000 yards for the season. And if he does it today, he'll become the seventh player in Cornell history to do so. Actually, the seventh time it's happened because Ed Marinaro did it on three different occasions. And there are the numbers of Levitt coming into the ball game. Well, the thing that he's so great with is that he just doesn't go down on the first hit. No matter when you hit him, he almost always gets three or four extra yards. And when you add that up over 20 or 25 carries, it turns into 100 yards. And that's how Levin has gotten all that yardage this year. He's up to 963 right now on second down and five. Larson back to throw. Fires across the middle. Complete first down at the 42-yard line. It's Jimmy Seifert, the tight end. Carl Ritchie made the tackle, and Larson looked sharp. Cornell, Cornell showing some things they have not shown all season. A straight drop pack tight pass that ends up throwing into the middle of the field. Cornell has not done much of that this year. They tend to throw the hitch. Watch. Straight drop back for Pear Larson and the tight end right in the middle of your screen, sitting down in the open area of the zone, far in front of the free safety number 93. The tackle made by Carl Ritchie, number 59, but not before Cornell gets a first down. Larson, three for three, 47 yards. He hands to Chad Levitt. Chad gets a couple of yards. Tackle made by Michael Kakja, whose brother Joe was an old Ivy linebacker as Penn last year in 1992. So Levitt leading the Ivy League in rushing. And closing in on 1,000. Eon Hu has four 100-yard games this year for Harvard is second. Terrence Stokes of Penn is third. And Pete Oberly is fourth, also averaging over 100 yards per ball game. It is third down and seven, second down and seven for the Big Red. The handoff is to Levitt. Levitt breaks a tackle, breaks another tackle, shy of the 50-yard line. It'll bring him a third down and short. Mark Walrap came up to make the tackle. Walrap playing with an eye shield due to an eye injury. He missed the last two games. You see Levitt does a good job of trying to find an open area, bouncing the play to the outside to get some positive yardage. Yale did a good job of closing in the inside, but also did a good job of pursuing outside and preventing Levitt from really getting going. He seemed to slip a little bit on the turf on the outside. So Levitt comes out, and Terry Smith comes in on 32 at the 50. Larson quick drop back, throws complete. First down to Eric Bierke. Larson using a lot of receivers thus far. Gets it to the 35-yard line. Dan Mellish made the stop, and another big red first down. Excellent read there. Bjorki doesn't even really run a pattern. They saw that he was uncovered. There wasn't a defensive back right over him. Saw that he could just run for the three yards, throw it to him right now, and they did so right in the seam of the zone, and Bjorki gets a first down. Excellent read by uh, Perry Larson, and a good throw as well. At the 35, first and 10, the handoff to Terry Smith. Smith breaks the tackle, gets to the 31. Smith averaging almost five yards per carry this year. Actually a little bit over five yards per pop. 5.4 yards per carry. And he is small, much smaller than Levitt, but being his background in wrestling, a very tough individual, two-time state champion in wrestling in high school. He is from... Fort Lauderdale, Florida, St. Thomas Aquinas High School. Second down and five. Lonnie Davis goes wide to the right for the Big Red. Single set back to Smith. Larson hands to Smith. Smith close to a first down. Vasella and Cox were in on the tackle. Also on the bottom of that file, Bob Greenwood. Well, you see, you know, yeah, if you hold it right there, guys, last week against Brown, Brown was packing in five or six guys right in the middle of the field. Yale is not doing that. They're playing straight defense, spreading the defense out a little bit. They're having to react to Cornell's formations. Cornell is not using the tight end as much. They're using three wide outs and spreading the players across the field. That is spreading out Yale's defense. It's going to make it easier for Cornell to run the football. Third and one, Larson, quarterback keeper, and I don't know. He was hit at the line of scrimmage by John Likaretsis, who missed last week with that slight shoulder separation. He leads the team in sacks, and he is a tough bookie at right tackle. It is short of a first down. It is fourth down, and on comes the field goal team. 
No, no, they're bringing in Ryan Masterson, the fullback. Per Larson still the ball game. You know, that, this is one of those things. If you get beat on the line of scrimmage the week before, and you're testing the metal and courage of your players, you're going to go for it right here and let your offensive line have a chance to make the play. All right, so a full house backfield on fourth and inches. Hand off to Levitt. Levitt was caught pretty good near the line of scrimmage by Tony Mazurkiewicz, and it depends on where they spot the football. Last week against Penn, Penn drove the football down against Yale to the one-yard line, first and goal from the one, and did not score. Went four times and was unable to get into the end zone. So Yale has shown an ability to be very tough on short yardage situations and they're gonna have to measure this one is a, a good effort again by Yale's defense on short yardage so they'll bring on the chains and this will determine whether Cordell keeps the football or we have a change of possession with 713 to go in the first quarter of play and they are short so Yale takes over Great effort by Yale's defense. You'll see Chad Levitt get hit and try to struggle for a little extra yardage. Great effort on, by every player on Yale's defense. In fact, Levitt first hit Ingham, number 40, his fullback who was blocking for him, and then just couldn't get the yardage for the first down. So Jim Hyde was not happy about it. He went for it. It was a situation where if you kick a field goal, you're talking about 45 yards. And it was just a good, solid defensive play by the Bulldogs. By the way, the referee today is Art Fellows, the umpire Roger Whitley, head lineman Larry Marino, line judge Tom Wheatley, back judge Steve Zimmer, and the field judge is Bob Carroll. First and ten for the Bulldogs, and the handoff goes to Bob Nelson. And Nelson breaks a couple of tackles, and a late flag is down the field. Nelson got about five yards on the play. And he has been sharing that tailback position with Keith Price and doing a real good job. Grabbing the face mask to call against Cornell. So they'll mark it off from the spot of the foul. Five yards, close to a first down. So it'll be first down and less than a yard. And now they say it is enough for a first down, so they'll move the chains ahead. So at the 37, first and 10 for the Bulldogs, Chris Hetherington at quarterback. He's got Bob Nelson in a tailback now instead of Keith Price. Hand off, Nelson, big hole, first down, into Cornell territory, and down to the 42-yard line. No fumble, his knee was down. Nelson, the senior, the mechanical engineering major from Michigan. Tom Koza coming into the football game said that the counterplay was going to be an important play for his team. They ran it right there, got a great seam, and Nelson went for excellent yardage. The counterplay, Tom Koza said, was going to be important, and, that, and it was on that play right there. First and 10 at the 42. Out of the eye formation. Hedrington runs the option, he keeps it, and he gets about five yards, and that's one of the plays where Hedrington excels. He does, yeah, he's so big. You know, one of the things that Jim Hopper said, he's 6'3", 223, he's bigger than a lot of the guys that Cornell have to tackle him. So he's very dangerous running the football. So he runs the football on the option, but he'll also run the football a lot on rollout. They'll run sprint out action, get a bunch of receivers to the, the wide side of the field, and then he'll run the ball. It's a, it's a very effective weapon for you. He had a season-ending groin injury last year in the first half of the first game. Some question whether he would ever be back, and he has come back full tilt. Hedrickson again running the football. He has a first down for the Bulldogs near the 35. So they really like having him back healthy. He got a hit pointer a few weeks ago, and he's really been subpar in the last couple weeks. He's been trying to protect his hip. Now he's got a much smaller pad. He told us yesterday that he felt as good as he's felt in a long time. So Yale is very happy to have him healthy, and he runs the ball very effectively now. First and ten for the Bulldogs, 5.35 to go. First quarter of play, Cornell leading 7 nothing. Yale at the Cornell 30. And a handoff to Nelson. He gets two or three yards. Emmett in on the tackle. And at the bottom of that pile with John Vitullo. There's a look at Carm Poza, who has been around the Dean of Ivy League coaches in his 30th year. 30th year, you, you realize that in the Ivy League, 
He, his tenure in the Ivy, Ivy League is longer than all the other seven coaches in the league <laughs> combined. All the other coaches' tenures added up are less than Tom Coe's time at Yale. Two years ago, he won the Distinguished American Award by the Walter Camp Football Foundation. Second down and seven, Henrington to throw. Henrington Lux can't find anybody, keeps the ball, gets to the 25. He'll be four yards shy of a first down. But Tulo again in on the tackle. Up that third down and call it two. Henry <laughs> to not hesitating to run it. You, know, you don't often see a quarterback run so quickly out of the shotgun. But with his size and speed, Yale likes him to run. In fact, you heard Coach Hopper say sometimes you almost think that they want the play to break down right. so that Henry can make things happen. Twins to the left side of the field for Yale on third down. Single step back is Nelson. Nelson gets the okay. handoff. And Nelson is shy of the first down by about a yard. Brian Draga made the stop. It'll bring up a fourth down and short at the 22. And right now, it looks as though Yale will go for it. And yeah, they are going to go for it. It's looks like a game where there's going to be a lot of teams going for it. They want their offensive line to control the line of scrimmage, and they want to believe in them. So Yale are also going to go for it on fourth and short. It's going out there a few minutes ago. Dan Parkins, Kenna Heffernan into the backfield. Two fullbacks. Hand off to Nelson. And I believe he's got the first down. Cornell says no. But from here, it looks like he made it. Again, it depends on the spot. the first down. We haven't seen the uh, the decision yet from Art Fellows. He may bring the chains on. I think Cornell has asked for a measurement. You see John Petula talking to the referee. And they are going to measure. From here, it looks like he has made it. Okay, it did look like he got it. Bruce. But sometimes, you know, you just want to make a measure just to get it straight. And by the nose of the football, first down. Coming into this football game, I said Carton Koza said that the counterplay was going to be important to him. Yale ran on that play. What it is is you take your, your, your strong side line and you block down. And then you're going to pull the other guy. So the, the strong side blocks down on the defense. And then the, the backside guys pull across the field. There's a kick out block here. And then the tackle leads the play up the field. Nelson. The fullback blocks off to the left side, and then Nelson counters back to the right side. First attempt for Yale at the 20-yard line. Nelson with the handoff. Nelson to the 15. And he is gang tackled there by Garrett Gardy. That was exactly it right there. Watch, you're going to see on this side of the field, these linemen are going to pull and lead the play. Nelson's going to start left and go right. Here's the counter play for Yale, and this is right here. See, the two linemen are leading the play. Nelson finds the seam. Drake does a nice job avoiding the block by the lead lineman and making the tackle on Nelson. That prevented the touchdown, really. It was wide open on the right side. Drake just got away from Brian Honkala. Second down and five. Out of the eye this time. Nelson, straight up the middle. He's at the 10 to 5. Touchdown! Great second effort by Bob Nelson. And Yale on the scoreboard. It is now 7 6 Cornell. No counter there, just straight at you. Yale tones their offensive lineman up front doing a good job. Zone blocking, and Nelson goes right through the middle, finds the seam, and goes into the end zone. Bob Nelson really shows good quickness ahead. You know, he's very aggressive to the hole. He doesn't shift much, not a lot of moves back in the backfield. He just finds a hole and goes, and it turned into a touchdown for Yale right there. 16-yard touchdown run by Bob Nelson, and on for the point after now is John Lafferty. Dan Iwan will hold. Lafferty's kick is up, and it is good. And we have a tied football game, 7-7. Seven, seven. The burst of Bob Nelson through the line of scrimmage. No hesitation, he sees the hole, and he just blows through it and just accelerates into the secondary of Cornell and fights through tacklers to get the football in the end zone. Great last reach by Bob Nelson, who gets his fifth touchdown of the year. We are tied at seven's first quarter of play. Basketball and men's ice hockey will be on. 
There's a look at Bob Nelson, senior from Ishpeming, Michigan. Mechanical engineering major. He had 544 yards last year. He's close to 450 already this year. And he did some good work in that last touchdown run to put Yale into a 7-7 tie with Cornell with two 23 to go in this first quarter of play. And Kevin, that, that big defensive stop by the Bulldogs on fourth and one looms large. Well, they did it last week, as I was saying. They stopped Penn on four straight plays from the one-yard line. So they've proven the ab ability to rise up when they're in that short-yarded situation. And they, they turn the game around, at least here in the first quarter. John Lafferty kicking off. That's received by Chris, uh, Victor Borges at the 20-yard line. He goes down to 21 immediately. And Borges has been one of the leaders in the Ivy League this year in kickoff returns. So Cornell has the football from their own 21, first time that they've started deep in their own territory. This rivalry, Yale, has been dominated by Cornell in recent years. Cornell has won the last four meetings between these two schools. Matter of fact, Carm Koza said, then he just can't explain it, but his team just has not played well against Cornell in ages. Chad Levitt gets the handoff and first down, breaks two tackles, gets to the 25-yard line. Mark Walrath made the tackle with some help from Garrett Cox. Perfect example there. Really not much available for Levitt, but he just kept fighting through tacklers, and he turned what was really nothing into a four-yard gain. That's a big thing on first down, you know, when you, you, you could face a, a second and ten instead. Watch Levitt run through tacklers. Quicks one, two, Carl Ritchie keeps moving, keeps working four guys who needed to take him down at the four-yard game. Here's Levitt on second and five. Levitt with a big hole, has a first down. Fumbles the football, it's still loose. Yale trying to pounce on it inbounds, and they do get the football. So Yale recovers, it's Michael Kopcha who picked up the loose ball, the sociology major from Birmingham, Michigan. Excellent play for, for Yale. Actually set up very well by Cornell. It was a good play. Levitt got a nice seam, got to the outside. But you'll see at the end of the play, I think it was number 93, Dan Mellish, who comes up and makes the hit. Actually gets sandwiched. It's number 14, Masala, that really knocks the ball loose. And you see the ball almost got knocked out of bounds. But a great effort outside by Michael Kopcher to get on that football. First down for the Elis at the 38-yard line. Hetherington runs the option. He is taken down immediately. Chris Hansen came up from his free safety spot, and it was a fine read on his part. It was. That's a great play. You know, often when you when you go against an option quarterback, you know, you hear about a Colorado, or these teams where the quarterback runs a lot. If the coaches will tell you it's tough because you have to defend 11 players. And usually it's the free safety who ends up shadowing the quarterback. And Hanson did an excellent job of penetrating, coming up aggressively, taking the quarterback out before he got a game on the field. A minute to go, first quarter, tied at seven. Second and ten, Hedrington, play action pass. Hedrington fires down the middle, incomplete, intended for Dan Iwan, and he had his six points in his hands. Yale is not afraid to take a shot. They will do this three or four times in every game. They'll give Danny Iwan a chance to go up the field and catch the touchdown, catch the home run. Great throw. Iwan just couldn't quite get to it. You know, that's one of those. He he He's going to stand up, and he knows he could have caught that ball. He's not going to be happy. As you, see, as you see him, he's not happy. He thinks he should have had it. And that is the end of the first quarter of play at Yale University. Cornell 7, Yale 7. More football coming up on Prime in a moment. Well, there was a lot to cheer about early for Cornell. They opened up a 7-0 lead. They were marching, but right now it is a 7-7 football game. Here's a look at some famous Cornell grads. Jane Brody, Wilson Greatbatch, who was the inventor of the cardiac pacemaker, a very important invention there, and Robert Kane, a past president of the U.S. Olympic Committee. Yell with the ball at the Cornell 38-yard line, third down and 10. Chris Hedrington back to throw, fires across the middle, it is intercepted, picked off by Doug Knopf. And for Knopf, his third interception of the season. 
guy who always seems to be in the right place at the right time. Excellent catch here. I mean, he turned into a receiver. It wasn't an easy catch. The ball sails a little bit on Chris Evington. He drops back. He gets good protection. You see, he's trying to get Iwan number three on a dig route. That's a crossing route. And the ball just sailed on. Went high. Look at the catch there by Nato. Stretching out and catching in the fingertips. You know, Iwan hoped that he made a catch like that on the fingertips. Not the defensive back turns it into an interception for Cornell. Not the applied economics and business management major from Scarsdale, New York, gives Cornell the football at their own 11. On first down, the handoff to Terry Smith, and he goes nowhere. Great pursuit by Garrett Cox, who hopes to go to medical school. been told that we are still in the first quarter of play. The teams are still going the same way. Apparently, the clock has 15 minutes to go. There's still some type of mix-up. <laughs> so we'll keep you posted on that issue. And if the, the clock up on the scoreboard is obviously not the official one. Something, something's happened to that machine. Larson, quick pass. It's complete. Grabbed by Steve Bush. Just a couple of yards out near the 15-yard line. It'll bring up a third down and five. Pete Noyes, defensive coordinator for the Cornell Big Red, talking to his group right now. And now we do have the official end for the first quarter of play. And now they have to go a long way to turn things around. So, the first quarter is officially complete. And the score, Cornell 7, Yale 7. We'll return to the Yale Bowl after these words. In the total life of the campus, emphasis upon intercollegiate competition must be kept in harmony with the essential educational purposes of the institution. The Ivy League provides the broadest-based intercollegiate athletic programs for men and women in the nation. The league crowns champions in 32 sports and annually advances scores of teams and individuals to national and regional championship competitions. This while continuing the strict adherence to its founding principles of some 40 years ago, principles that have helped define the term student-athlete. Welcome back to the Yale Bowl, which is celebrating its 80th birthday. Yes, it opened back in 1914 at a very small price of $750,000. The scoreboard erected in 58. The Giants played here for a couple of years while they renovated Yankee Stadium. This will be the main venue for the World Special Olympic Games in 1995. Cornell with the ball, third and five from their own 15. Handoff goes to Terry Smith, close to a first down. Dan Mellish came up to make the tackle, and it depends where they spot the ball. It is enough for a first down for Cornell. Well, last week was a disappointing game for Jim Hoffer and his staff. I asked him what the tone was coming off the loss to Brown. Well, we had to admit that we, uh, that we stunk that we didn't play very well in the ball game and, uh, and that we got outplayed by a team that played much better uh, in the previous ball game. Uh, the feeling very much was to, to get it out of our system. And you do that by how you practice, you do that by how you communicate, you do it by what you ask, uh, if not demand, of the players and the team. And uh, in light of all those things, I think our, our football team responded exactly the way we would have hoped and exactly the way we would have expected uh, a really quality football team to respond. Cornell did actually scrimmage on Monday and Tuesday this past week, usually light days for the Big Red. Chad Levitt picked up five, it's second down and five. Levitt with the handoff straight up the middle, maybe three yards. Adam Hernandez made the stop. As you look at the first quarter, I think, you know, Jim Hopper can't be too disappointed with the way his offense has played. They've been able to move the ball a little bit on the ground. As you see Carl Cozy there on the sideline. They've been able to move the ball a little bit on the ground. They mixed it up very effectively with some long passes on their first drive to make Yale honest and not just pack the offense in. They're spreading Yale out and they're moving the ball pretty well. They just need to keep them turning Footballing. Third down and two for Cornell at their own 30. Tied at seven, just underway. Second quarter. Hand off Chad Levitt. And Levitt goes over a thousand yards for the season as he bangs up to the 38-yard line. Tackle made by Tony Mazurkowitz and Rob Masella. But Levitt, the sophomore from Melrose Park, Pennsylvania, has now eclipsed the 1,000-yard mark. Yeah, and it's just a huge thing for, for Levin. Let me just show you what I'm talking about. Last week against Brown, these guys were packed in and playing very aggressively, and there was another linebacker here, and this guy was tighter. Yale is spreading out with the formation, and it's allowing Cornell to run the football. On 
first down, Levitt goes out, Terry Smith comes on, and Terry Smith picks up a yard on the play, tackled by Jeff Stone. Here's Chad Levitt. As you pointed out, Bruce, over a thousand yards, and he joins a very impressive list at Cornell. Ed Marinaro, of course, tops the list because he did it three times. Derek Harmon, Scott Malaga, Joe Holland, Levitt, with still two and a half games to play, is over a thousand. Scott Malaga uh, is now an associate athletic director. He's back in Ithaca, back working for the Big Red. Just a great tradition of running backs there for Cornell, and, and Chad Levitt just a sophomore. On second and eight, Smith wide open, and he dropped the ball. It was well thrown, and he knows it. It'll bring up a third and eight. Jim Hopper was upset last week about some of the execution more than anything else. Remember, they had 11 penalties in the game and five turnovers and some real costly turnovers. That, you know, Steve Joyce was playing quarterback last week and had a, had a difficult time just pitching the ball to, to Chad Levitt a couple times. Actually, Chad would have, had, would have been over 100 yards last week, but he lost about 40 yards on pitches that were funded. Third down and eight. Larson runs the option. Larson keeps it. Not a play we've seen very much this year. He gets to the 43, especially considering his tender knee. Carl Ritchie made the stop. Ritchie, the all-Ivy linebacker, who had 80 tackles coming into today's game and five interceptions, as we mentioned earlier. That leads the nation at that position, linebacker. I think the amazing thing is that the next, the, the next defender on Yale, the next most tackles is 49. So he's 31 tackles ahead of any other Yale defensive player. Back to punt. Tim McDermott. And it takes a Cornell bounce. Iwan watches it bounce inside the 20. And it drops at the 12-yard line. So a productive punt by Tim McDermott. And the Bulldogs will take over from their own 12-yard line. 11.37 to go in the second quarter. We're tied at 7. Kevin Guthrie back at the Yale Bowl in New Haven, Connecticut. Cornell and Yale tied at seven, second quarter of play. Chris Hetherington leads out the Elis from their own 12-yard line following the good punt by Tim McDermott. Hetherington runs the option, keeps it, turns the corner, gets up to the 18-yard line. Nick Bomback made the pop, but flag is down the play. Flag thrown behind the play in the Super offensive line area. Hetherington so strong upfield on the option, you know, he doesn't look like he's thinking about pitching it at all. He's got that ball in his hands. Blocking below the waist, clipping penalty against uh, Yale is going to bring that play back. You and I were talking to Hetherington yesterday, Kevin, and that injury that he sustained last year was very, very severe. Yeah, you know, it's a strange thing. I've never heard, we'll get the officials call here on the penalty. <laughs> Watch late in the play here as Hetherington runs the option. Might have been on Emmett right there. A couple guys looked like they got blocked in the clip. 95 Emmett getting knocked down from behind. I think that was the clip that called that play back. It set back Yale back inside their own five. So it's first and 16. And a loose football, he hangs on to it. Bob Nelson back at the three-yard line. So Yale, him back deep in their own territory here. And Cornell trying to capitalize. Seth Payne won't get any credit. That's, that's the offensive line coach, Scott Stocker, for, for Cornell working with his offensive line. Seth Payne, number 91, is the one who made that play for, for Cornell. He won't get credit for a tackle. What he did was he drove the Yale offensive lineman back into the backfield, prevented Nelson from getting any kind of bubble. Second down and 19. Hetherington back in his own end zone. Fires. Incomplete. Pass intended for Jesse Steinfeld. And it'll bring up a third down. And long back at the three-yard line. Shaken player back at the two for the Elis. There is an injured Yale player down in the field. One of the interior linemen, I believe it's Roz Jaswell. He is a biology major from Grandview, Missouri, and Coach Carm Koza coming out to the field to check on him. Going back to Hetherington's injury for a minute, Kevin, it, we talked about the fact that it, it was such a severe muscle pull that it actually pulled it off of the bone. Yeah, his, the muscle, or what they call the adductor that goes down the inside of your leg, inside the, the, the thigh, actually ripped away from the bone. 
and they had to go in and reattach it uh, to the, the muscle, to the bone, and rehabilitate. I mean, he's done an amazing job just to be back out here playing football again with that kind of injury uh, and to, to go through surgery for a muscle pull. I've never heard of that before. You know, you always hear about hamstring injuries right. and all that. Uh, this one was so severe that they had to go in and reattach it. Let's take a look at the Ivy League scoreboard with three other games today, and all of them are important in this Ivy League race where five teams are basically still in the hunt. Brown leading 17-7 to over Harvard, coming off their victory over Cornell last week. It's their best record for Brown since 1987. And Harvard, of course, their coach Tim Murphy began his coaching career at Brown. Columbia and Dartmouth are tied 7-7 in the second quarter of play. Columbia looking for their first winning season since 1971. And then the big score of the day, Pennsylvania leading Princeton 9-6 in the second quarter. That Penn D giving up only 5.8 points per game. Well, today they've already given up six. Penn's won 18 in a row. That's the longest streak in Division I AA. By the way, the all-time record is held by Holy Cross, 20. They did it during the 90-91 season. Jaswall came off the field under his own strength, appears to be okay. For Yale, however, it's a third down and 19 from their own three-yard line with 10.49 to go in the second quarter and tied at seven. Hetherington back to pass, deep in his own end zone, fires complete to Nelson. He'll be shy of the first down. Gives the Eli's a little bit of breathing room at their own seven-yard line, but they'll still have to punt it from their own end zone. Good zone defense by Cornell. Basically, they decide, look, we're not going to give them the first down. We're going to bring our defensive coverage back. We're going to let them throw the football in front of us, which they did, and then just make a tackle. Hetherington had to take the short pass. There was no way there was going to be a first down. Chris Allen drops back deep. The punter is Jay Waller, five yards deep in his own end zone. Good snap. Low kick. And it bounces across the 50 and down to the 41-yard line. A very good punt under the circumstances by Waller. Well, almost all the time, you know, the worst punts turn into the best punts. When you kick that low-line drive, there's no way that the, the return man wants to come up and catch it. He doesn't want to kick the ball as you see the kids playing on the sideline, close your, close your eyes with that finger, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah the, the Lucy Charlie Brown thing. But, you know, when you, you talk about uh, those kicks that go low, the, the return man doesn't want to come run up there, kick it, make a fumble, make a turnover, so the ball usually bounces for a long way. Turn out first attempt in their own 41. Levitt back in the ball game, gets the handoff, gets only a couple of yards on the play. Good dang tackling by the Yale defense. Well, there's no doubt that this is going to be a heck of a last couple of weeks in the Ivy League. Penn undefeated going into today. They've got Harvard, and they're at Cornell. Cornell is at Columbia next week, and then Penn a tough finish. And you can see the rest of the slate with those five teams pretty much still in the race mathematically in the Ivy League. Second down and nine. Levitt with the pitch. Levitt turns the corner. He's to the 45. He's upended. As he gets to the 47-yard line, Rob Vassella made the pop. Vassella last year became the first player since the World War II era to touch a football and varsity play for the Yale team. You see him play a toss sweep. Tony Mazurkiewicz, the, the strong safety, penetrates nicely, but you see Levitt set up the block a little bit there and keep his balance. He pretended Mazurkiewicz, he, you know, he faked Mazurkiewicz like he was going to go inside and then came outside and created some room for himself out there. By the way, Masella, the first freshman since the World War II era to touch the football. Third and five. Larson, quick drop back. Throwing for Berryman, incomplete. A good pickup on the part of Larson with the blitz on, but the pass went astray. Well, I think what they wanted to do on third and short there was get Berryman on the little hitch. You know, the play that Cornell's had a lot of success with this season. Go up five yards, turn around and get it. But Yale was in a blitz with tight man-to-man -man coverage. You can't run a hitch against tight bump and run man-to-man. You've got to convert it to a fade. Perry Larson did a nice job throwing the ball up and away where only Berryman could get it if there was going to be a play made on it. Tim McDermott will punt. Dan Iwan back deep, waiting for it in zone 20. Good boot by McDermott. Bear catch Iwan at the 13-yard line. So once again, Yale will start deep in their own territory. 8.34, second quarter. We're tied at seven. Come on, Red! Let's go, Red! Let's go! 
Well, the big red of Cornell tied with Yale, 7-7. Second quarter of play. Cornell 6-1 on the season. 3-1 in the league. Yale 3-4 overall, 1-3 in the Ivy League. After three wins, they've lost their last four, but they did play commendably last week against Penn. On first down, Keith Price with the pitch out. Price turns the corner. He's over the 20-yard line and out of bounds. We talked a little bit about, about he um, Hetherington's injury and coming back from the groin injury. This guy right here, number 22, Keith Price, had a knee injury that many people said he would never play again. It, the doctors describe it, you know, in that sort of vivid way that it looked like a bomb went off in his knee. Just a total destruction of his knee. As you see his numbers this season, he was over 1,000 yards a couple years ago for Yale. He is a fine back. He's still trying to come back, I think, to 100%. He doesn't look like the back he was a couple years ago, but you got to take your hat off to him for his effort coming back from a major, major knee injury. And Price breaks a tackle and gets a first down up near the 30-yard line. He bench press is 425 pounds, so his upper body is extremely strong. The doctors basically said to him, you know, hope you have a normal life, and that's what they were trying to accomplish. They weren't worried about him coming back to play football. He had two operations in September and January, and here he is. He came back from the major blown-out knee, has shown tremendous heart, and he shares that tailback spot with Bob Nelson. Well, and I think, you know, he, he's a senior. He was starting to get to close to the end of the season, and you get the Epson Ivy Bowl coming up where the All-Stars in the, in the Ivy League go to Japan. He's a guy, based on his career, even if he doesn't have the best numbers this season, who ought to go to Japan. First down, it's now Nelson with the handoff, and Nelson gets only three yards. Gardy came up to make the stop with some help from Chris Hansen, and also on the bottom of that pile, David Woods. I saw Coach Hopper there on the sideline looking at his sheet. You know, offensively, Jim Hopper's thinking, you know, we haven't been able to really get it going the last couple drives. The first quarter was good except for the turnover when we got the fumble. The last couple drives haven't been able to, to get it moving really, even with some good field position. Second and seven for the Bulldogs from the 33. Hedrington runs the option, fakes the pitch. Beautiful fake by Hedrington. First down across the 40-yard line. Tackled by Brian Draga. The option is really difficult to defend because, you know, oftentimes, most teams, you don't really have to defend for the quarterback. You don't have to have a guy on him. And Hetherington's so tough running the football up the field. He's, you know, he's as big as Chad Levitt. So when he gets it going upfield, he's tough to bring down himself, and it just creates more problems for you defensively. Hetherington, 6'3", 223, from Avon Old Farms High School, North Brantford, Connecticut. First and 10, Yale at the 41. Hand off, Price. Price lunges forward. He gets three yards. Good low tackle made by Brian Draga who has been active throughout the season. He is second on the team in tackles behind Gary Gordy. So Price and Nelson, a formidable one-two punch in that tailback spot. We've seen a lot of teams in the league employ two tailbacks, including Cornell with Levitt and Smith. Who and Thompson with Harvard, and so on down the line. Second and seven for the 44. And the give is to Price. Greg is after him. Price breaks the tackle. He's across the 50. He may not have the speed of air, but he showed a pretty good burst there before Chris Hansen made the stop. Well, I asked a lot of people, you know, like after watching him on film last week, if he was 100%, and they said, well, maybe not last week, but we think he's back this week. As you see the work inside by Yale's offensive line, they do a nice job. It's a counterplay again, and Price just makes a decision to take it outside, and then makes a nice cut, and you said, as you said, Bruce, good burst and acceleration up the field to make a big play out of what was really a stop for Cornell. 5.57 in the second quarter. First and 10 for Yale at the Cornell 43. Hand off, Price, stop, dead in his tracks. Good pursuit by Draga, and some help from Steve Buss, and also in the play was Kevin Bennett. Now the Yale Bulldogs trying to get it together, breaking a four-game losing streak. That is what they're trying to accomplish. And Carl Cosa said he just can't explain it, but they just have not played well against Cornell. Jim Hopper has never lost to the Elis in his four years at Cornell, this being his fifth. So he is 4-0 and against Cosa. Cosa 16-13 and against Cornell overall. Hedrington rolls out. Breaks a couple of tackles and scrambles his way near the 35 
tackle made by Garrett Gardy, and Pete Noy just can't explain how that one broke down. Yeah, that's going to be so frustrating. Pete Noy is the defensive coordinator right there in the glasses. He's watching the play. He sees his defense well positioned. Watch the play here as Hetherington rolls out. Good pursuit, good angles by Cornell. They got a blitz on Wagner, number 13, penetrates, forces Hetherington outside. Then he just finds a seam, accelerates, and gets good yardage. The play looked like nothing, and Hetherington turned it into something. Third and three at the 36. Hetherington, straight drop back, has time, throws complete. First down, John Aram, the junior from Boston, with his 14th grab of the year. So, so far in this game, you know, Yale has run the ball much more effectively than they did last week. As you watch here, the secondary setting up for Cornell, they were in a blitz. So you see they're all in man-to-man -man coverage. See how they're locking in on their guys, man-to-man. -man. And a good little route there and a completion. Draga helping out from the linebacker spot, but not before Yale can get a first down. They spotted at the 28-yard line of Cornell. First and 10 for Yale. Tied at seven, second quarter of play. Handoff to Price, a big hole, and he breaks off one player. He's close to another first down at the 19-yard line. Good drive for Keith Price. Yeah, good job for Yale's Toads. You know, the inside offensive line for Yale, they're nicknamed the Toads, and they've done a nice job up front. They are doing everything right, running the football. David Woods gets picked out, overreacts, Wagner overreacts a little bit, and Price, number 22, coming straight at you, takes a good hit by 29, Chris Hansen, but not before he got good yardage near the first down. Second down, less than a yard, just inside the 20. And off to Price, first down, inside the 15 to the 14. And good work by the Toads in this drive. Jay Sturhan has been the lead Toad. He has five times this year been named Toad of the Week. He's number 50, the starting center. Well, hey, when it, no matter what, what else happens in a football game, in the end it comes down to these guys right here. If you can get your hat underneath the defensive lineman and push out like that inside, you're going to win a football game. If you can do it time in and time out, there's no way the team's going to stop you. Cornell's defensive line has to stiffen up here and play a little tougher football against the LZO. Great block there by Sturhan. First and 10 for the Elis at the 14. Hand off Nelson. Nelson gets a couple of tough yards. John Wagner came up to make the stop. And it will bring up the second down and eight. Two minutes, 54 seconds left in the second quarter. 7-7 ball game. Cornell struck first on the touchdown pass. Pair Larson to Aaron Berryman. And then back came Yale. Nelson on a 16-yard touchdown run. Both scores in the first quarter. Second and eight. Hedrington runs the option. And this time, Draga wraps him up. Also coming up was Nick Bomback. And it brings up an interesting third down, Kevin, at about five. Well, last week against Penn, the best thing Yale did was a short passing game. They really moved the ball well against Penn with their short passing game. And number 80, Jesse Steinfeld, who's coming into the ball game right now, was a big reason. He had seven catches last week. I wouldn't be surprised to see number 80 running a little curl route and Chris Hetherington trying to throw the football out there to Steinfeld. Third down and four. Wide to the left goes Steinfeld. To the right, Iowa. Hedrington rolls. He is hit from the blind side by John Vitulo. The senior from New Hartford came up to make the hit, and there is a flag on the play. There's a flag early from the linesman. Cornell was showing blitz, and they may have, have gotten the neutral zone, but wait for the call. It's because Chris Hedrington doesn't look too happy. And the preliminary call against Yale. A legal motion against the Bulldogs. Play will be declined. Cornell shows the blitz. It just has too many guys for Yale to block. You see the, the defender go by. He's playing man-to-man -man coverage. The blitz is on. And from the backside, number five, Vitulo, Hetherington did not even see him coming. And the sack results in, in, a, in a loss for Yale. And they'll probably set up for the field goal. So the ball goes back to the 15, making this a 32-yard field goal attempt by John Lafferty, who replaces John Stolzer this week as the number one kicker. The holder on the play will be Dan Iwan. A 32-yard attempt by Lafferty. Ball placed down. The kick is up. He's got plenty of foot. It is good. And the Yale Bulldogs take the lead 10-7. 
So Cornell's defense stiffened to force the field goal, but Yale still comes away with three points. 120 to go, second quarter, Yale by three. So Yale on the scoreboard again, a long drive. Good running on that drive by Keith Price. It ends up in a John Lafferty field goal, his first of the year. And it's 10-7 in favor of Yale with a minute 20 remaining in the first half of play. And now Lafferty will put it back in play. Let's see what the Cornell Big Red can do with still some time on the clock before halftime. Victor Borges drops back deep. And it's Borges with the ball at the seven. He's to the 20 and he hurdles to the 21 yard line. Well, here's a look at some famous Yale graduates. William Howard Taft, a past president of the United States. George Bush, who was the captain of the baseball team back in 1947, and Bart Giamatti, Mr. of Baseball. You know, Cornell was very effective in their first drive throwing the football upfield. Berryman on a touchdown, Berryman on a corner route. They're probably going to need to throw the ball upfield a little bit here if they're going to be able to score before the end of the half. Trips on the field for Cornell on first down. Larson runs the option, keeps it, and goes down. Bob Greenley made the tackle. Greenley has been hobbled by injuries this year, but still leads the team in sacks. There's a good look at Greenley, 6'4", junior, philosophy major from Sanford, Florida. He rode for the crew team last year, and he's also been on the track and field team, so he's quite an athlete. And in high school, he was the state shot put champion. And they, listen to this, Kevin. His father played and was an Eli captain in 1966. You know who his coach was? Carl Koza. Well, you know, Co uh, Coach Koza started out with 65. I was three. <laughs> yeah. Oh, don't give away your age in the air. Oh, sorry. Carl Koza, of course, was from the cradle of coaches. He played his ball at Miami of Ohio. Look at this group. The head coach was Woody Hayes, the assistant was Eric Parsegian. His teammates, just some of them, went on to be head coaches. Twelve players in that team went on to be head coaches, including Bill Arnsparger, Bo Schembechler, Bill Mallory, John McVeigh, John Font. I mean, this team was a very studious group. <laughs> well, you know, a lot of the time they say the best coaches are not the best players. Maybe they really weren't that good, you know? I mean, they say, they say that a lot of the time, you know, the guys, these guys that, that weren't great football players end up being the best players. Coaches. Maybe that was the worst football team in America. You know, there's a whole bunch of coaches on the team. <laughs> Cornell with the ball on second down and 12 from their own 19-yard line. Blitz is on. Lawson puts it up for Lonnie Davis, and it's incomplete. Rob Masella was back on the coverage, and Masella did a real good job one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah, he's in good position. It was funny, Masella never really looked back for the ball. He just stayed right on Davis, and even when Davis went looking up for the football, Masella didn't make any kind of play for the ball. He just tried to stay in position and, and make it difficult for Davis to make the catch, and he was successful doing that. 57 seconds unofficially remaining in the second quarter. Cornell now with third and 12. Larson back to throw, pressure and goes down. Back at the five and it's Greenlee that made the stop, his fourth sack of the year. And see all of a sudden Yale has a chance. Cornell is now pinned deep in their own territory. He's gonna have to punt it from under their own goalpost. May not even be able to get their full depth on the punt team. Yale calls timeout, may try to block this punt here, or at worst, get good field position with Dave Iwan catching the punt and trying to bring it back. And Yale's had a lot of success this year on the specialty teams with blocks and fake kicks and onside kicks and the such. Yeah, they always try to mix something in there. Last week they tried on the on the opening kickoff to work a, a little pooch kick, kick a high ball and try to get under it and steal away an early kick. They onside kicked against UConn and converted it into a touchdown, one of the big plays that led to their victory against UConn in the third game. So they do try some special things and they may try to block this punt. Three block punts on the year and Tim McDermott is standing only two yards or three yards away from the back of the end zone. The other point here is that Yale with time, 46 seconds to go before halftime, 
And whereas we were thinking Cornell might try to move the ball, now Yale looks like they'll be in excellent field position. Iwan drops back at the 45 of Cornell. Tim McDermott waits for the punt, eight yards deep in his end zone. And he gets it away, a spiral, well done. Iwan hails at the 38. He dances across the 30 to the 27-yard line. Now with 34 seconds to go, Yale will try to get more points. Watch Iowa on the return, but watch the block by number 47, Patrick Kelly for Yale. It'll come from the right side of your screen. Iowa, gutsy play, makes the first guy miss. That man right there, number 51, Gillickson, gets blocked by Patrick Kelly, which sprung that play for an extra six to eight yards, and Yale has great field position. Stay ready, Steve. Stay ready. So Yale with the ball at the 27 of Cornell. 34 seconds to go. First half of play. Two wide outs to the right, one to the left. Single setback for the Elis. That's Bob Nelson. Back to throw is Hetherington. Fires deep, he's got a man at the two-yard line. Dave Frabella in his first and goal with 28 seconds to go in the first half. Frabella, the tight end, who replaced their all Ivy performer, Jim Langford. What a nice throw by Hetherington. You know, he threw a nice touch pass over the linebackers, let that ball settle in. Pribble is banged up. He's hurt or something. He wanted to take himself out of the ball game, but the Yale coaching staff sent him right back in. A nice catch by Pribble, but an excellent throw by Hetherington. 20 seconds to go in the first half of play. Goal to goal at the one. The pitch is to Nelson. Touchdown! So Bob Nelson gets his second score of the day. And Yale extends their lead. to seven in favor of the Bulldogs. 11-6 remaining unofficially in the first half. And boy, that return by Iwan was key. On to the extra point now, John Lafferty. Nick Sanchez will hold. Kick is good. 17 to 7. Yale on top of the Shell Shock Cornell team, which led 7 0. Let's go back to the pass that set up the touchdown, Kevin. Just nicely thrown by Chris Hetherington. You know, he's thrown a couple interceptions today, had a tough time, but he gets good protect protection and just throws a nice touch pass right on the money. Hanson had great coverage downfield on Pribble, but perfect throw. And now here, the touchdown, just great blocking up front. An easy touchdown here for Nelson. Good lead block by the fullback, and it's an easy score. Nelson with six touchdowns on the season. Coach Jim Hopper and his club, who looked like they were going to dominate the first quarter, up 7-0 in marching, and now trailing 17-7, and not much he can do before halftime with just 11 seconds remaining. Marcos' team looking to snap a four-game losing streak. And that defensive stop seemed to ignite his ball clock. 11 seconds to go here at the Yale Bowl. This is the 502nd college game played at this facility. Well, as you look at the, at the first half, Cornell struggled a little bit in the second quarter offensively, was not able to make get any drives going, and, and Yale's been able to, to make big plays. You talked about the, the key return by Iwan. And, you know, what happened also was the Greenlee, interse uh, the Greenlee sack, which forced Cornell deep into their own territory, inside their own five to punt. And that created the opportunity for Yale to get the touchdown right before the end of the half. So Lafferty will kick off. And it's a short kick. Returned at the 23-yard line by Dave Rickle. Clock shows five seconds, but we did have a problem with it at the end of the first quarter, so that time is unofficial. And now with the ball at their own 26-yard line, first down. Seventeen-seven Yale. 
And that was a quick drive off the final turn by Iwan. Two plays, a good pass to Fabilla, and then the touchdown run by Nelson. Larson will just down the ball to end the first half. And Cornell trails 17 to 7. And the Big Red now having to regroup. Yeah, they will. It's going to be tough to go in down 17 to 7 and to lose seven points right there at the end of the half. You know, offensively, Cornell did some good things in the first quarter, especially on the first drive, but the second quarter was tough for them, and they just got to regroup, and they have to do a better job defensively up front. Uh, Yale moved the ball on the ground in that, in that first half, and defensively, Cornell just couldn't stop them. So Yale goes into the locker room up 17-7, and Coach Jim Hopper, it looked early on as though you were dominating the game, and then that fourth down where Yale stopped, you seemed to turn things around a little bit. Well, yeah, that was a disappointment, uh, not getting the first down uh, on the fourth and one, and, uh, and I would do it again. We just simply didn't execute well enough. We've gotten a couple of turnovers against them. We have not stopped them here in the second quarter. That's been the difference right now. Coach, you had a great first drive. Mix the pass and the run together very well. You get the football back here in the second half. What can we look for? Well, I think we got to keep doing the same thing. The things that got us in the end zone early, uh, we've got to do it again. And we, we lost an opportunity as we started a drive with a fumble. And uh, we'll come back. Okay, Coach, good luck. So Jim Hopper heads to the locker room with his club trailing 17 to 7 and a key game for his team if they want any shot at getting a part or the title in the Ivy League. We'll be back. Welcome back to the Yale Bowl where the Bulldogs lead the Big Red 17 to 7 at the half. And our guest at intermission is Jay Morley, the Senior Vice President and Acting Athletic Director at Cornell University. And your thoughts on the first half, you've got to be a little disappointed. It looked like Cornell might be blowing them out early on. Yes, well, this has uh, been a problem like we've had during the year, that we've got up real good the uh, first part, and then they seem to let down a little bit. So there's a little disappointment, but uh, we'll see what Jim can do with them in the middle and the uh, halftime talk. What kind of enthusiasm has there been on campus this year with the great 6-1 start? Well, it's been terrific. Uh, yeah, the, the student uh, newspaper and the students have really been uh, up with the team and great spirit, you know, at the home game. So uh, we I think we can take care of this one and bring it back. Charlie Moore taking over as the new athletic director. Your thoughts on uh, the challenges he faces and on him being a fine candidate? Well, Charlie Moore brings an awful lot to uh, Cornell. He certainly has a long history of working with athletics at the policy level, particularly with the uh, Olympic Committee and, uh, of course, his uh, record as an Olympic athlete. And he has, brings a lot of business skills as well. And, of course, he's just uh, very well grounded with the alumni. That's going to be very important in all of our development alumni relations activities you know if you look around the league there's four new athletic directors that have come on in the last six to eight months uh, what will they be hoping to accomplish in the upcoming years well I, I think uh, one I don't think there'll be a huge change in the policy level activities but we're all trying to maintain a balance of a large uh, diversity of programs 34 to 36 teams at the institutions uh, funding is always going to be an issue and certainly um, gender equity will be a challenge for all of us as it is around the country and you also have a president who is so well respected Frank Rhodes and there's a continuing search for a for a new president of the university how important will that selection be in terms of where the athletic department is headed well I, I think it'll be important obviously but Cornell has always had a fine tradition in athletics as well as a broad uh, physical education and mural program and I'm quite sure the uh, trustees who will make the selection will consider that as an important part of the criteria looking forward to the winter sports season and might we see some success as well oh yeah well the uh, hockey team uh, talked with uh, coach Mike uh, you know uh, Brian McCutcheon and he's excited about the teams and basketball has been coming along and along with the women's sports so uh, yeah I think we'll have a great winter season as well Jay Morley senior vice president and also acting athletic director. Thanks for joining us. We wish you and the Big Red much success in the future. Well, my, my pleasure. Thanks a lot for having me on, Bruce. Thanks. Well, we want to talk more about the Ivy League and the individual games today because I'll tell you, this is a big day in the league as far as the scoreboard is concerned. And right now, Brown coming off that victory over Cornell, leading Harvard 17-10 to 10 at the half. Columbia and Dartmouth are tied at 7, and Penn with a 19-12 lead over Princeton at the half. And here's a look at the standings right now with Penn unbeaten and looking to make it five in a row. Cornell just a game back, but as you can see, Princeton, Columbia, and Harvard all thinking that they still have a chance for the Ivy League title. They are all 2-2, two and two, and Columbia has really been charging hard. Here at the Yale Bowl, 
Yale with the lead at the half over Cornell, 17 to 7. More of our halftime show in a moment. Halftime at the Yale Bowl, and the Bulldogs lead the Big Red of Cornell, 17 to 7. After falling behind and trailing 7-0 in that first quarter of play, Bruce Beck back with Kevin Guthrie. And Kevin, a shocking turnaround when you consider the fact that Cornell was dominating the line of scrimmage. The big defensive play by Yale seemed to spur the ball club on, and Yale pretty much dominated the second quarter. Yeah, they did. I think you made a good point at the end of the half there where you said that that, that fourth down play where, Yale, where Cornell went for it on fourth and short, Yale came up big, and it turned the game around. The first drive Cornell had was a fantastic one, really. They threw the corner out to Berryman. They threw the go to Berryman for a touchdown. They mixed up, pass, and run very effectively, and it was just a great drive for them, and they got that first score. You watch it right here, as you see Perry Larson drop back, and he just makes a great throw to Berryman out in front. You'll see number one just reach out and make the catch for the touchdown, but it was the end of a very effective and productive drive for Cornell. A 24-yard touchdown catch by Berryman set up by the Chris Hansen interception. Then it was 7-7 as Yale scored on the touchdown run by Bob Nelson. Yeah, that was easy. It was just a, a, a short inside play, but then it broke for good yardage and a touchdown as Nelson just exploded through the line. It was an excellent drive for Nelson, but Yale's been able to mix it up. Nelson's had some good carries, and Price came on strong in the second quarter also. And Lafferty kicked the field goal to make it 10-7, and then all of a sudden it looked like we might go into the locker room 10-7, but Yale comes up with a with a strong return of a punt by Iwan, and then the pass play, which was just a beauty, as Hedrington went up top to Prabilla. Great touch pass here. You know, sometimes quarterbacks try to throw this thing too hard. Just a nice, soft ball that comes right in to the tight end, Prabilla. He's covered well. Hanson, 29, does a nice job. What happened there, though, and what happened to Cornell all in the second quarter was not enough pressure on the quarterback and not a good enough job at the defensive front. And the touchdown will show it here. Watch. Good blocking all across the front for, for Yale on Cornell's defensive line, and that's really the way the second quarter went. Defensively, Cornell could not stop Yale on the ground, did not do a good job up front. you got to believe that Yale's confidence, although they had lost four games in a row, had to be up because they lost to Penn 14 to 6. They played them extremely well. Statistically, they were right there, and coming into this game, they felt like they had a pretty good chance. Well, I guess, you know, too, when you've got an experienced coach like Coach Cozy, you know, you realize the season isn't over, and, you know, Yale comes into their last game, they, the end of their season, they play Cornell, they play uh, Princeton and they play Harvard so they never give up they've always got big games at the end of the year and so I think that's why they're playing well today they never give up they did play those tight games as you said against Penn they played tough games against Dartmouth lot losing a tough one they, they have played well and just not been able to win gorgeous November day for football at the Yale Bowl in New Haven Connecticut and so far Yale has been doing it they lead it 17 to 7 over the big red <laughs> Big Red playing their marching band on the ground here at the Yale Bowl. It is halftime with the Big Red trailing by a score of 17 to 7. Let's take a look at some of the halftime numbers. And it started out with Yale really not doing much offensively, but they ended up with 223 total yards. Yeah, look at the rushing, 178 yards rushing. I think that's something that we did not expect coming into this football game. I did not think Yale would be able to run the ball as effectively as they have. They were not able to run the ball against Penn at all last week, but that's a very good Penn defense. Still, I didn't think Yale would be able to run the ball that well. Cornell will get the football first in the second half of play. Traditionally, that first drive of the second half has been their most effective of the football game. They usually come out with Levitt carrying the football like a workhorse. Yeah, I, I think I think it has to be today, too. They have to set a new tone for this football game right off the bat at the beginning of the second half. They did it in the first half. They had a great drive. I think they will work Levitt, but I think Coach Hoffer will also try to mix in pass and run. In the second quarter, he ran the ball pretty much. In the first quarter, he had the mix with the pass, and I think you might see him spread out the field and try to throw the ball a little bit here on the first drive. This might be the big Biggest half of the season for the Cornell Big Red trailing as they have been for much of the year 17 to 7 but you know that they've got those two big games ahead against Columbia and against Penn. Coach of Yale is Carm Coza and his club leads at half 17 to 7 and coach what did you tell your ball club at intermission? Well you know keep it going uh, the way we started I thought they were going to blow us out of the stadium fortunately we regained our composure and had a good drive and started playing pretty good defense. This is a very physical team we're playing, and we know that we have to play really hard for 30 minutes. Coach Cozy, you ran the ball very effectively in the second quarter. Did that surprise you at all that you were able to move the ball on the ground like that? 
I can't hear you with this fan playing in my ears. I'm sorry. All right, Coach, uh, what about your rushing attack? Did it surprise you? All right. It's hopeless, Bruce. <laughs> coach, we thank you. That band is too loud. I told you to stay away from marching bands, Coach. <laughs> right now it is time for another look at an integral member of the Cornell University family. Right now, Peter Schwartz, professor, textiles and apparel. Undergraduates are fully capable of doing research, and they are as good as graduate students in many cases for some given the right type of project. Part of, of any type of education, any type of, of learning is, is research. And we do try here at Cornell, especially with the fact that we have a research university, to, uh, to give students research experiences in the labs as part of their, their education. Most of the students in, in this college and in this department where we can fit them with, with research projects, we get them actively involved in, in our lab work. My research area is working with interfacial shear strength of composite materials. What I do is apply a small drop of epoxy to a single Kevlar fiber. We then measure the length of that bead that I have applied and measure the fiber diameter. Later on, we take these fiber samples down to an instrument machine where we measure the, the load required to pull the fiber out of that bead of epoxy. This load, or this peak force, is related to the interfacial shear strength of the composite material. Carbon fiber epoxy composites are used in many things, primarily bicycle frames, which are the new rage because they're really light and everyone wants lighter bicycles and airplane wings also. And that's where this testing comes in to see how it can stand the vibrational effects from the airplane wings because you don't want something that's going to fail from just a little bit of movement when it's in an airplane wing. I've learned a lot about teamwork. I've learned a lot about research in general, about different techniques, about how to approach a problem that you don't have an answer to. This is my first research experience, and I'm finding that I like it. And the Cornell Big Red returning to the football field, trailing by a score of 17 to 7. And in a situation where they really have to get something going in the second half if their dreams of an Ivy League title are realistic. What a beautiful day to watch a game and for youngsters to come out here to the Yale Bowl with some great history, watch some college football, maybe get something to eat, grab a pennant. Just perfect. Jim Hopper we know what knows that uh, his ball club offensively has to get it going the way they did in that early drive of the first half. Well, when we asked Coach Hopper on the way off the field, what would we look for in the second half, he said more of the same, and I think he meant more of the same that we saw in the opening drive of the football game, where there was a lot of success, as you see, the also number 28 there for Yale on the sideline, and had a good first half. He threw 10 carries, 57 yards, and those two touchdowns. Chad Levitt did go over 1,000 in that first half. He had 12 carries for 69 yards. Aaron Larson, 5 for 8 in the passing department. Hetherington, 4 for 8, two interceptions. Could have had a touchdown if I won hadn't dropped that one ball. This team, over the course of the season, tended to play its best when its back was against the wall. And I think for its entire season right now, in terms of an Ivy League championship, it is, its back is against the wall right now. So we'll see how they respond. In other games, late in football games, they've been showing a lot of character, bouncing back, making the big plays. Well, now they got to make the plays for 30 minutes in the second half that could decide their fate for the league title right now. We are underway in the second half. John Lafferty boots it deep, and it's taken by Victor Borges. And Victor gets only to the 17-yard line, and he is dropped dead in his track. Chad Levitt, who went over 1,000. Well, it wasn't much of a factor in that second quarter of play. Air Larson out at quarterback. He has gone the entire way, recovering from the sprained knee. We've not seen Steve Joyce today. First and 10 for the Big Red from their own 18-yard line. And it's Levitt on the handoff. He goes down immediately. Dropped by Bob Greenlee and Carl Ritchie. Well, what a combination they've been. Yeah, and Greenlee's really played well. He made the big play at the end of the half, a sack that dropped Cornell back to its own five and set up the punt 
that turned into a touchdown for Yale. Here, Greenlee makes another big hit early in the second half. Jim Knowles, the offensive running backs coach, sending in some plays. Bear Larson needs the big red out of the huddle. And he sends Berryman to the left. And double wideouts to the right and Birke and Shulman. Larson, back to throw, has time. And he throws incomplete. He was looking for number 86, Matt Shulman. Berryman, meanwhile, had been clear on the left side of the field. Well, there was some kind of confusion. Shulman started to settle down. That is, he was running up the field, and then he slumped down as if he was going to stop and maybe run some other kind of route. But the throw was all the way downfield as if Shulman had been sprinting the whole time. So there was some kind of miscommunication as Larson throws an incomplete pass. Third down and about 12 from their own 16. Big play because Cornell does not want to give Yale field position if they alter here. Larson steps through the pocket, keeps the ball, gets to the 20. He does not get enough to the first down, but he gives Yale a little bit of breathing room. At, at least Cornell some breathing room on the punt. The tackle made by Garrett Cox. Obviously not what Cornell wanted to do in the first drive in the second half, which is to go three and out. Now they're going to put their defense on the field. Defense was on the field a lot in the second quarter. You remember Yale had that set over seven-minute drive. Cornell went three and out quite a bit in the second quarter, and their defense has been on the field too long. Eventually those guys get tired, and that's how touchdowns are scored, and that's how ball control offense is you down. Tim McDermott will punt. Dan Iwan is back deep. Iwan had a very good return to set up the second Yale touchdown in the second quarter. A catch called for by Iwan at the 45-yard line. His brother Dave graduated last year. It's at Yale single season records with 873 receiving yards during the campaign. So good field position for Chris Hetherington. You see that number 91 on the back of Hetherington's helmet? That's the number that Jim Lankford, the tight end, the all-Ivy tight end, wore before he got injured. And I think he basically just took the numbers, the decals off the helmet of Lankford and put them on his own helmet, just as sort of a... To, to, as, as an honor to the player who's fallen for the rest of the season. Let him know he's carrying him with them. Price on the handoff, stopped behind the line of scrimmage. Good pop by Draga and Bennett. Did you see Keith Price? Just a counterplay. Did you see the lineman on the left side coming toward you? But good penetration by Cornell. The way to stop a counter is if you get penetration and bounce those linemen off their track so that they can't turn up field, get the kick out block, get up field. You'll never get yardage if that happens, if they get defensive line gets penetration. Second down and 10 from the 45. Hedrington, waggle action, in trouble, being pursued and goes down. Great feet on the part of Seth Payne. He is the sophomore from Victor, New York, communications major. Very solid during the season. And he showed some speed. Watch Chris Hetherington here. Every, all the action is going to go to the to the screen's left. He runs to the right. All of his receivers are running down the field on the other side of the field. Some kind of confusion there where Chris Hetherington started the waggle and went the wrong way and had no receivers downfield to throw to. Him. There's Hetherington's numbers on the day. And it's third down and 13 at the 42. Cornell shows blitz. Hetherington is being blitzed and he's nailed by Chris Hansen who came up from the weak side and grabbed him for a big loss back on the 32-yard line. Cornell first started showing this last week against Brown. Third down situations, they blitzed quite a bit. Here they do it again, number 29, Hanson, coming off the outside. Normally a free safety, snuck up on the left side and just went in untouched, really, and just sacked Hetherington. Jay Waller will punt from his own 20. Chris Allen back deep for the big red. And this time, Allen picks it up on the run, and a bold play by Allen as he gets it to the 42-yard line and gave his team maybe 10 to 15 more yards. So Cornell with good field position, thanks to the play by Allen, will take a timeout, 17-7 Yale, third quarter from the Yale Bowl. A good look at the Cox Cage on the Yale University campus. Uh, what is just a beautiful November day, temperature in the 60s. The wind is starting to pick up now, and the sky's a little bit more overcast than when we started. 
Cornell starting in their 42 on first down, and Chad Levitt is stopped very quickly by Jeff Stone, the junior from Holliston, Massachusetts. So far in this football game, Cornell has not thrown to the backs at all. They haven't, usually you'll get a, one or two screens a game or quick passes to Levitt a game. So far they haven't really tried to throw to Levitt. And I would expect him to try to do that at some point here in the second half, getting the football to number 33. Second down and call it eight. Larson throws a bullet. It's complete to Lonnie Davis. And Davis has first down yardage. Tony Mazurkowitz and Rob Masella in on the tackle. And they'll move the chains up. Hey, that's tough work right there for a receiver. You're running a, a slant route right into the teeth of the zone. Two guys in zone coverage right in front of you. Perry Larson stays right, right with, it, with it, makes a nice pass. And a good catch by Lonnie Davis as he gets hit by, by two Yale players. That's the first completion since early for Larson. He went five for five, then 0 for four, now one for one. Larson, three-step drop, looks, throws, complete to Davis. Nice catch by Lonnie at the 43-yard line. Well, I tell you what, though, that was a dangerous throw. Number 27, Tony Mazurkowitz, a strong safety. You might see him in the screen here. It's a hitch route. Watch Davis go about eight yards. C-27, lower corner of your screen. He's trying to get out underneath that hitch. And he knows he was very close to turning a pass into an interception and a touchdown. But as you said, nice catch by Davis. Ninth catch of the year for Lonnie Davis. Second and five. Larson looking for it all. He's got Berryman out there. It's incomplete. Berryman ran a little pitch and go. And he had beaten his man clearly, Rob Masella, but Larson overthrew him. That's the second time that we've seen receivers on deep pass routes have the ball go right out beyond their fingertips. The wind is blowing this way. The wind is behind the quarterback. So you wonder, is that ball carrying a little bit? And is the receiver having trouble running it down? Does he think that maybe it's not going to go as far as it does? And he ends up a little short of it. The wind is behind Cornell right now. Larson, three-step drop, in trouble. Now he throws it out of bounds and a real smart play there. Yeah, that was a good play. That was a senior play. He, he, he tried to throw the ball at first. He had a man in his face. He stepped back. He knew he didn't have anything, and he threw the football away. And then the young, young man from the water crew retrieved the football. <laughs> But that, that's the right intended receiver on that play. Throw it to the water crew. That's what Perry Larson did because he had nothing. Absolutely right. Fourth down, McDermott on to punt. It's fourth and five. Dan Iwan drops back at his own ten. McDermott nails it again. It bounces at the seven. Oh, when it goes into the end zone. And Chris Allen was down there, had he been a little bit over to his right, he might have been able to grab that football at the one-yard line. So Yale will start from their own 20, 9.30 to go. Third quarter, Ivy League football from the Yale Bowl. Chris Beck and Kevin Guthrie back at the Yale Bowl. 9.30 left in this third quarter of play. Yale with the football from their own 20 and leading in the game 17 to 7. And the Yale defense has been very stingy since early in the football game. In motion goes Aaron. Hand off big hole to Nelson. And he busts out to the 25-yard line. Hanson in on the tackle. And also Garrett Gardner. Like the seam develop in the right side, right lower part of your screen. Nelson does a good job of reading it and cutting back against the flow, and he just runs out of the tackle of Brian Drager. You need your inside linebacker, number 54, to make that tackle. Gave up five yards. Nelson with two touchdowns already in the game. And the handoff to Nelson, and he has met and stopped Drager and Gardy in on the tackle. Rega started it, and Gardy finished it. Garrett Gardy at strong safety, number 21, has been so consistent this year. His father played quarterback at Montclair State. His uncle, the head coach currently at Hofstra, Gardy's favorite hobby, to fish. And he goes fishing for running backs every week. So often, you know, when you tell, say a guy's the most improved player, it's kind of a backhanded compliment. But this player is so much better than he was a year ago. He has made huge strides, and he's been the key defender on Cornell's defense all season. Third down and two. Nelson breaks a tackle. 
strikes another tackle, bounces off of Guardy and gets a first down at the 36-yard line. There's one that Pete, that will drive the defensive coordinator, Pete Noyes, crazy. He had the people in position to make the play. Nick Baumbach, number 17 on the outside, will come up, and he's got a chance to make this stop and turn the football over to his offense. Watch 17 right there, squares it up, and Nelson, a good run. Chris Hansen misses a tackle, Guardy misses a tackle, and it's a first down for Yale. First and 10 at the 37 for the Bulldogs. Henry 10 rolls left. Fires on the run, and it's incomplete. Tended for John Arrow. Brian Dragon, number 54, the inside linebacker, did a nice job that time because what he did is he started to drop back into pass coverage, and instead of staying with the pass coverage, he saw Hetherington break contain, and he went after Hetherington. He didn't let Hetherington run the football up the field. It was a nice play by Draga. It forced Hetherington to throw the football, and it was an incomplete pass. So it brings up a second and 10. This Yale passing attack, 181 yards per game. That's fourth in the league. Out of the shotgun formation. Hetherington looks across the middle, fires a bullet, it's complete. Up near the 45-yard line. Dan Iwan made the catch. It brings up a third down and about three. I'll tell you what, this is a heck of a throw because you're going to see the defensive coverage. Go ahead and let it go here. You're just going to see the defensive coverage all over the receiver. And the ball right in the center here. You're going to see Iwan just barely a seam, and the ball is just right on the money. And a good completion for Yale. Third down. Two yards to go at the 45. Eight men up in the line of scrimmage for Cornell. Flags are down, a dead ball foul. And it looked like there was some movement by Michael Bender on the offensive line. And if so, it'll be a five-yard penalty against the Eli. A jumping toe. <laughs> a jumping toe. What you don't want to have on third and short, if you're Yale, is a jumping toe. And there's and the jumping toe is coming off the field. And he's replaced by Roz Jaswal. Looked like he hurt himself a little bit. He looked like he was limping a little bit. Maybe, maybe that just could, might be a, you know, the way the off, big offensive line and run. You know, they're never that smooth. So you're never, not never, exactly never, graceful like you wide out. Never quite sure whether they're limping or not. <laughs> Actually, it's a great running back to have a, that athletic strut where you think they can't run. Third down. Back to throw Hedrington. Fires. Complete. No catch. Yeah, it's going to be an interesting call there. No catch by the official right on the play. And it will bring up a fourth down and seven. It's one of those plays, you know, where is the receiver going to come down with his feet in bounds if he doesn't get hit? Watch, I'm going to have to go up for the football. Ball back 17 right on the play. Now, in the NFL, they would have ruled this a catch. Oh, that's a, that's a catch anyway. He would have come down in bounds. You see, he got knocked out of bounds, had no chance to get his feet down. And so it's going to be a, a punt for Yale. That looked like a good catch to me. And a low punt hit by Waller. Allen decides not to pick it up. And he's had a couple of falls today where he's had to make a quick decision. That time he let it go, and it goes back to the 17. I tell you, that's tough, though. Yeah, that, you're that, damned if you do, you're damned if you well, don't, right? The ball is kicked so low. Uh, I've been back there. When the ball is kicked that low, you, you just sort of, you, you don't want to come up and kick the thing. So you, you make a decision early. I am staying away from that. Remember last time the ball bounced, he, he picked it up and ran it and did a nice job. Take a look at the Cornell possession since that touchdown. And as you can see, sputtering offense, to say the least. First down and ten. The pitch to Smith. Curry breaks a couple tackles. He's across the 30-yard line. Has a first down at the 33. Pat Kelly made the stop, but not before the freshman had picked up good yardage. This is what Cornell needs right here. Terry Smith, right from behind the end zone. Quick pitch outside, let Smith choose the hole. He finds an open, he makes him Zerkowitz miss. See, nice little move there. Number 27 got knocked to his feet, and a good run by Smith. And there was a penalty after the play, a face mask call against Yale, which brings the ball out to the 38-yard line. And it's first down for the Big Red. Watch the play action pass right here. 
the 14-yard pickup plus the five-yard penalty. Larson pitches to Smith. And he goes down. A flag is down on the play. The tackle was made by Dave Gorsica, who wasn't fooled at all. A show toss sweep going to the left side, and then you let your back cut back. But it didn't work, and I think you're going to get a holding call against Cornell. And that's exactly what it is. The worst kind of penalty, a first down holding call, it puts you at first and 20 and takes away so many of your options. They're talking to Carl Ritchie, the 118th captain at Yale, which is a great honor because only one player per year is selected. So it will be first and 20. You know, a lot of the time coaches just try to get 10 yards here. Might like see a short pass or, or a screen pass of some sort to Terry Smith. Three wide outs on the field for Cornell. And the handoff is to Smith on the draw. He gets five yards back. Bob Greenlee and Tony Mazurkiewicz in on the tackle. And now it brings up a second down and 20. And you're right, Kevin. It's like starting deep in a hole. It's tough. You know, they, they had the great first down run by Smith. They started to get something going. They got the face mask penalty. And then they got a holding penalty against themselves, which put them in a big hole. Let's go, Bush! From the 30-yard line, they call it second and 18. Larson, nice fake. Larson looking deep downfield. And it is caught by Steve Bush. He is on his way for a touchdown, but hold everything. A flag is down on the play. A flag is down at the 24-yard line. It may be defensive pass interference, and if so, the touchdown pass to Bush will stand. Touchdown pass to Bush, the sophomore from La Habra, California. And the call is against Yale and Cornell back in the football game. Cornell has consistently beaten Yale's corners deep down the field with long pass plays. They haven't been able to complete them, but they've been open. Now here, Walrath just trips over his own feet and has trouble making closing the gap on Bush and then just pass interference. Bush does a nice job of keeping his concentration on the football, keeping his feet, staying up, and getting the touchdown. If you're going to commit that pass interference, if you're wall wrap, obviously, you don't want to let the receiver go ahead and make the catch. Great concentration on the part of Bush. A 70-yard grab from Larson. And now off to the point after touchdown is John Rhodes with 5.14 to go in the third quarter of play and a chance to cut the lead to 17-14. Kick is up and good. So the Big Red, pretty much a grind them out type football team, uses the long ball to get back in the ball game. Larson to Bush, 17-14, third quarter of play. We'll be back. Steve Bush with a 70-yard touchdown catch. He's had two catches on the day, two for 75 yards, and coming into this ball game, he had two catches for 34 yards. He, he did a great job of focusing in on the football. There's a penalty on the play, something, get, something against Yale. Is, we're now going to kick from midfield, a 15-yard penalty. This would be a penalty that was assessed on the point after touchdown. Therefore, it goes to the kickoff. And so Cornell can do a lot of different things here. You might try an onside kick. You could try a little bit of a club kick. What do you think, Kevin? What you don't want to do is kick the ball in the end zone. So often you see guys do that. They, they, kickers get out there and they just blast the ball in the end zone. They want to kick the same kind of kick they kicked early in the game, that high, short kick. He wants to put it down about the 10, between the 10 and 5 yard line on either the right or left side. Let his coverage get down there and pin Yale you know, deep in their own territory. So Tim McDermott, who does the punting, also kicks off. And let's see what he tries to do. And he kicks it into the end zone. And I want to down it. See, I just think that's what you don't want to do. You, know, you want to go ahead and pop the ball short. You don't want to kick it into the end zone, but 20-yard line it is for you. So Jim Hopper's defense did the job of the first couple of times in the third quarter. And just enough time to get his offense going. Here's the scoreboard. Brown still leading Harvard in the third, 20 to 10. 
Dartmouth leading Columbia 13 to 7. Dartmouth gave up 882 yards in the last two games, but today a little bit of a different story. And Penn undefeated and looking to roll 19-12 over Princeton at Palmer Stadium. First down for the Bulldogs. Keith Price. He is stopped at the line of scrimmage. Draga on the pursuit, along with Emmett and Gardy. And the intensity, you can see it almost picking up defensively for the Big Red. Well, they're glad to be to be in a game now that's only a three-point game instead of a ten-point game. You know, you see your offense get a big play like that, a lot of the time you get uh, some, an extra boost of energy, and you should look for that on Cornell's defensive front. And the same thing goes the other way. A lot of the time, you know, deflate the opponent. We'll see if Yale gets deflated here by that big play. Second down and ten at the 20. Hendrickson rolls out, fires complete, close to a first down. Rodriguez made the catch. And let's see where they spot it up near the 30-yard line. Gale likes to run that play. They like to run, they flood the, the defense that's in a zone coverage. And a lot of time you end up throwing to that short receiver and let him run up the field. That's what Chris Hetherington did right there to get the first down. He noise defensive coordinator. He's a little happier with his defense now than he was earlier in the football game. And off, Price, nothing doing. He ran right into one of his offensive linemen. It was Jack Hill, and he went down. Number 66, Jack Hill, right guard. You see him right there, the right guard. Watch, he gets hit. the penetration by David Woods, ruins the entire play. Hill gets knocked into the hole. Price runs into him, and there's nothing doing as Draga makes the tackle. Cornell has a an injured player down at Stick Emmett. He came in with a, a, a bad knee. It looks like he's going to go off the field. But a nice play by David Woods, number 59, the defensive lineman for Cornell, driving Jack Hill back into the play and really closing the hole down as Keith Price had nowhere to go. So it brings up a second down and 10. Emmett leaves the game. And he's replaced by Dave Rickle at that left end position. Now to the shotgun once again. Henry did block and sickle. The blitz is on. Henry did fires. It's knocked up in the air and incomplete. And Dan Iwan almost had a second chance to grab the football. And if he had, he had nothing but daylight in front of him. Wow. Hetherington tried to throw the ball. There's some kind of miscommunication there. Watch, watch Iowa. He'll, he'll start with an inside release, go up the field, and then just hook. Now, the ball is thrown to the inside. See, Iowa was working outside. The ball knocked up into the air if he'd been able to get on it. What Iowa felt as he, as he turned around there was he thought, I'm more open to the outside. So he started to lean outside. Hetherington threw inside, and Allen had a chance to make the play on it. Third and ten. Hetherington rolls left. Downfield, incomplete. Back in the coverage was Chris Allen, and a flag is down. John Aaron was the intended receiver. Now we might see a defensive pass interference here against Allen. I believe he was a face guard in the player. He couldn't even see it. It is pass interference. It'll be 10 yards from the line of scrimmage and a first down. On the right side of your screen, you'll see John Aaron going up the field, 88. Allen actually picks up the football, but then he puts his hands on the receiver. That's why he got the call. You see how his hands stretched out? That's why he got the pass interference. It really wasn't a bad play. He was in good position, but as soon as he got his hands up and out away from his body, that's where he's going to get that call. So they move the ball to the 46. First down for Yale. 3.45 to go, third quarter. That was a big penalty, because Yale was going to have to punt the ball, and that was a big first down for Yale. Play action pass. Hedrick to the first down, looking long down the middle. It's incomplete. No flag on that play. Dan Iowan actually ran into Nick Bomback. And a, a good no call. Yeah, I agree with you. That was a good no call all the way. Both guys, everybody had about an equal chance to get after that football. Nobody had an advantage. You watch down the field. The ball just thrown way over the top. Two receive the, two, the two players collide. I think it's a good no call there. Iwan has been very active. He's a holder on kicks. He plays on special teams. He's a split end. 
He does a little bit of everything. Five catches against Dartmouth, four against Lehigh, four against Holy Cross. Second down and ten. Draw play to Price. Trying to get to the outside, being chased by Hanson. And Hanson pulls him out of bounds. And it brings up a third down and about 12. Well, the thing you got to like there about Hanson is just the pursuit all the way to the end of the play and then had the knowledge not to rip him to the ground on the opposing team's bench. Well, yeah, you know, son, you see that happen so often in tax 15 yards and a personal foul. It would have been a huge penalty. He did a good job of just making sure that the runner was out of bounds and not doing anything foolish. And it was just a good defensive play by Cornell all across, stringing the play to the outside. Hendrick did on the day, 6 for 14, two interceptions. As you can see, Larson has been better, especially with no turnovers and two touchdowns. Hetherington throws across the middle, it's incomplete, intended for Iowa, and a late flag has been thrown. A flag on the 40 of Cornell. Strange flag there, late. Left away for Art Fellows, the referee to sort it out. It may, it may have been a call that was an interference, but because that ball was deflected, it may be negated here, and you may see the official say no call. Let's wait and see what Bellows and his staff have to say. Right, that's what the call is, an inadvertent call. It was illegal motion also, they're saying. Watch the play here. I want only goes up for the football with one hand. You'll see right, right here. You know, the interference is called on, yeah, upfield on Allen again as he went after trying to try and make it a play. But as it turns out, it'll be nothing, and Yale will have to punt. You see, I was going to run a little in pattern. He's the intended receiver. Now, he tips the ball, and then the pass interference takes place, and that's why they didn't make a call. So Jay Waller has to punt it away in fourth down. Back deep is Allen. This time he takes it at his own 18, and he spins ahead to the 25-yard line. Nice return by Chris Allen, the freshman from St. Charles, Illinois. Allen's father, Mark Hall of Famer at Cornell, played football, was a real big quarterback, and his mom played tennis at Cornell, so you could say that was a nice marriage or a nice merger. <laughs> Take a look at some famous Cornell grads, including Dennis Williams, Bob Zelnick, and C. Everett Cooper. First down for the big red, Larson, play action. Throws it out complete to Ryan Masterson, who has a first down at the 36. Dan Mellis in on the tackle. That was the same play that Steve Bush scored a touchdown on. The same, same basic action, the fake hand off to the left, roll out right. And Barryman, that time number one, was running up the sideline wide open, just like Bush did. Per Larson took the shorter choice, which was a good choice, but I think he could have thrown the home run ball. And Masterson looks like he's shaking up on the play. Remember, Cornell lost Ned Burke, their starting fullback with a broken clavicle last week. Here's Chad Levin with some running room, breaking tackles, churning ahead to the 45-yard line. Paul Ritchie made the stop. I want to pass along our best wishes to Ned Burke, who has the broken collarbone. I don't believe he made the trip this week. He would have been just too uncomfortable. I think we'll probably see him next week at Columbia. But Burke, one of the unsung heroes, has the fullback paving the way for Levin all year long. Right, but you said we might see him at Columbia. We might see him on the sideline. He's done yes, for the year. That's right. Uh, with that clavicle injury, he's not going to be playing enough. No, I wasn't trying to confuse him. Right? <laughs> Second down and two. Larson to Levitt. First down. A little bit more up near the 48. Greenlee and Licaretsis made the tackle. 232, third quarter. Yale 17, Cornell 14. Levitt now at 80 yards for the ball game. On the season, Levitt at Fordham and against Brown was under 100. And otherwise, he's been over the century mark. First down for the big red. Larson, waggle action, throws, and it's incomplete. Intended for Doug Ingham. And 
ball thrown down by his shoe tops. Oh, they had a good play, though. They, they fake the play action left, roll out. Behrman running the takeoff route, clearing out the zone. The fullback slipping into the flat, and he was open. As you said, the ball just a little too tough for him to handle. He could have gotten good yardage up the field. Larson's got all the way at quarterback. Coming back for the knee injury, suffered against Brown. He has played well. Single setback on second and ten. Hand off Levitt. Levitt churning ahead, getting seven or eight yards. Michael Kopcha and Carl Ritchie made the stop. Michael Kopcha, the linebacker from Yale, his, his brother was an all-Ivy linebacker at Penn a few years ago. As you watch the inside look, double team on the nose guard. Good scene created there for Levitt. But he just works hard for that extra yard and takes a couple hits. Third down and three. And back to throw, he fires, it's incomplete. Pass intended for Lonnie Davis. And it brings up a fourth down and short. Well, this is the classic situation where you, you think about a fake punt. Uh, in this ball game, though, with a 17-14 game, Cornell probably wants to keep the field position advantage, so I would guess that they'll kick it, but they don't want to have their punter kick the ball in the end zone. So McDermott will punt it to Iwan, who waits for the ball back at the 10. McDermott averaging 36.1 on the season. A little better than that today. Good punt. They're now with a chance to down it, and they will, but not until the ball came back out across the 20-yard line. Punt down at the 22. So Yale will take over. And there may be a little bit of discussion during the week about the coverage on a couple of these punts. Well, that's, yeah, that was a tough one, though. They just took a bad, bad bounce for Cornell coming directly back. They kind of overran it. They kind of overran it. Yale with the football. And when you talk about tradition, you talk about academic tradition, Eli Whitney, the inventor of the cotton gin. Samuel Morse, the inventor of the telegraph. You want to invent something, Kevin? You might as well go up to Yale. <laughs> First down, option Hedrington. And he is hit and stopped by Chris Hansen in aggressive play by the free safety. All those guys were inventing stuff like 100 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> nice defensive play by Cornell. Really not much there for Hedrington on the option out to the outside. A lot of football was invented here. Uh, Newt Rockney even said at one point, after they talked about the Notre Dame shift, so where did it come from? He said, uh, where everything in football comes from, Yale. Second down and nine. He's coming! He's coming again! Shotgun for Hedrington. He's in trouble and he goes down. There was pursuit from the left and the right, and the pocket collapsed. Some of our mics were picking up the Yale coaches, I think. He's coming, he's coming, referring to Guardi, who's the strong safety who came on the blitz. Cornell secondary, all in man-to-man -man coverage. Having to drop back, couldn't find a receiver quickly enough. The, the, the pocket just collapsed on him on the blitz. It's going to be third and long for Yale. Third down and 14. With a couple of seconds left in the third quarter, the clock winding down. And that is it for the third quarter of play. So Cornell down by 10, is now down by three. We head to the fourth quarter of play at the Yale Bowl. And we'll take a look at another scholar athlete from Cornell, and then we'll be back with the fourth quarter. Okay, Bruce, you talk about tradition, right? Right? Yeah, here's one right here. <laughs> Saybrook College, one of the residential colleges at Yale. This is the Saybrook Strip. It happens at the end of the third quarter, every home game at Yale. Obviously, uh, it's self-explanatory. Just one of the other traditions to go on here at Yale. I'll let you handle that one. All right, well, you don't want to, you know. Ivy League traditions have all types. And there's one right there, the same big strip. Fourth quarter ready to begin. Yale 17, Cornell 14. Third down. Hedrington drops it off to Iowa. He's got some running room. He's across the 30, breaks the tackle. He's got a first down near the 45 yard line. A little dump off to the split end, Dan Iowan, and it results in a big pickup. 
that inside screen. You know, he's very quick and very fast when he breaks into the open. Watch here, it's an inside screen. He'll come from the left side of your screen, straight drop back. The lineman let the defensive lineman go. Hetherington does a nice job of just staying in there, taking the hit and delivering the ball on the money. Good blocking up field by all the guys. Jack Hill, 66, makes a nice block on Chris Allen to spring the first down. 27 yard pickup on first down. Hill goes to the ground. Big yardage for Bob Nelson to the Cornell 44. That inside screen for the wide receiver, a huge play for Yale. Third and long, getting ready to punt the turnover, get a good push downfield. Now they go to their running back, get good yardage, and you can see Jim Hoffer's concern about what happened there defensively. First down for the Bulldogs at the Cornell 44. It really had Yale on their heels, and that play, that screen might turn it around for Yale. Remember, that was third down and long. Third down and about 15, and they converted. And now a big break for Nelson. He breaks tackles, and he turns to the 22. So that little dump off pass to Iowan sparked this drive. Now Yale is down deep in Cornell territory at the 23. Football is such a game of emotions. Cornell has been playing well defensively all half. And now one play, a couple breaks. Nelson breaks a tackle from Gardy, and he's off to the races down the field. A good effort by Hanson catching him from behind, where he might have gone all the way. First and 10 at the 23. Hetherington hands off to Nelson. He gets to the 18-yard line. Draga at the bottom of the pile for Cornell. There's the Yale counterplay. Counterplay. Pete Noyes looks concerned. The defensive coordinator. Amazing how it can turn on just one play. I mean, that's what emotions are like down in that football field. The defense has been doing a good job for Cornell. They're in great shape. Third and long. Yale converts a big play, and all of a sudden they're moving downfield. Except for the one pass interference ball. The defense had a very solid third quarter. You think? Yeah, I agree with you. Second down and five. Just underway in the fourth quarter. The pitch is to Price. He breaks a tackle, and then he gets sandwiched at the 15-yard line with Tulo and Baumbach. There's Keith Price. You see the play off the right side. 76 did a nice job getting his hand back in there. He could have gotten a call for a hold on bus, but a nice tackle by Nick Baumbach. He got help from John Vitulo. Good bounce off by Vitulo. And a big third down. Third and four for Yale at the 17. Hand off. Price did not make the first down. He is stopped at the 15. It'll be fourth and two. I think they go for it here. I think they go for it. See, if they kick a field goal, they're only up by six. I think they're going to go for the first down here. This is an important call by Tom Koza. This is an important play in this football game for both teams. Tom thinking about it a little bit, but he's going to go for it. Fourth and a yard and a half at the 15. 11.50 left in the game. Yale 17, Cornell 14. The pitch is to Price. He did not make it. Good pursuit by John Wagner. And three or four other white shirts were in there. Great defensive play by Cornell. Yale choosing to go with a toss sweep. Sometimes that play can be slow to develop, and if they get penetration, they can stop it. And watch the work by the left side of Yale's deep, I mean Cornell's defense. Great pursuit. Great job of setting the corner on the outside and helping inside by Gardy. Drago was also there and made a big pop on that play. And Cornell takes over from their own 16-yard line. Chad Levin on first down, breaks a tackle. Levin breaks another tackle. He's still churning forward. And he spins near the 35-yard line. A 19-yard pickup. Walk up and Stone made the stop. And that was just a great individual effort. So now the emotions go the other way, right? We saw the, the, the screen pass turn the emotions in Yale's favor. That's the kind of run that turns your offense around. Watch Levin here, and I'm just going to let him do his, do his thing. I'm not even going to talk about it. Maybe seven guys put a body on him, and nothing happened. And at first down, the other tailback, Terry Smith, picks up some solid yards, five or six. 
Mellish on the stop. Levin is over 100 for the sixth time this year. He had one 200-yard game. Now he's over 100. Remember earlier today, he went over 1,000 for his season, becoming only the seventh guy to do it in a single season, or the seventh time it happened. And there's the running backs coach, Jim Knowles, and he's got to be smiling off that last effort. Second down and four. Terry Smith. Yeah, that's, that's good coaching, right? <laughs> Chad, let him run yeah. Tell him to just knock off people and keep going. Don't fall down. Don't get tackled. A yard for Terry Smith. And it brings up a third down and three. There's the story. And 18 left in the game. Now leading 17-14. And another one of those third downs, and you hate to use the word big over and over, but we've had a number of plays that have been important. Hand off, Levitt, he's got some running room, gets to the outside, and he drags the man for a first down. It was Rob Masella, who's 170 pounds, Levitt weighs 220, and Levitt said, I'm just going just gonna to get enough yard at first, first down with a carry, you don't mind, do you? That was an amazing alignment by Yale, they had everyone packed inside, Cornell running an outside play, and watch Levitt here, he's not the first down yet. Watch him work for it. It's a good effort. Good coaching again. Jim Knowles, good coaching. At the 48-yard line, first and 10. Terry Smith. And an interesting move here by Coach Jim Hopper. He is substituting freely. His two backs who are so different, they can cause a, a lot of havoc for a defense. Yeah, and they're going to keep doing that for so long, too. Smith, a freshman. Chad Levin over a thousand yards, just a sophomore. And they're very different, like you said. You know, Levin's kind of a steamroller, there's Carn Posers. Steamrolling kind of runner. Smith's quick and shifty, like a big mega. Hides behind his line. Very different runners. Levin back on the field. Smith got four at second and six at the 48 yard line. Larson rolls out, looks downfield, fires to a wide open receiver, Eric Bierke. First down, Cornell. 29-yard line of Yale, and that waggle action has worked all day long for Cornell, with Larson reeling away from the fake handoff and throwing it downfield. That's a great job by Larson, though, because you're watching the right side of your screen. Greenlee does a great job penetrating again. Watch 94. When the penetration is that deep, it's very tough on the quarterback. You see, he's running to his left, trying to throw right-handed. He feels pressure. Watch how good he throws his football. Right on the money. That's a tough throw to make. First down, Cornell at the 29-yard line. 8.30 left in the football game. Larson, three-step drop, looking for Berryman, incomplete. Larson threw to Berryman for the winning touchdown against Dartmouth, which culminated that brilliant 97-yard drive. And again, looking for his favorite receiver, the senior, the industrial and labor relations major from Culver City, California. Berryman comes into the football game with 24 catches. That was the same play they got the touchdown earlier on. Just a straight go, fade route, try out the quarterback lead him into the end zone, but it was only good. Second and 10. Yale leads by three. Levin with a hole. And then stopped at the 25. That was a great individual play by Michael Kopcha. That was a great hit right there. Because he stood Levitt straight up and sent him straight down. You don't see that very often. 225 pound Levitt doesn't often go down like that. Good inspired effort by Yale's defense. So now it's third down and six. At the 25. Can you say big play, Bruce? No. I'm going to save that turn. Larson drops back. Larson looking for Berryman. Yeah. Line. Post corner route. That was the route that Barry 
scored the touchdown on late in the Dartmouth game. The Yale corners beleaguered all day. Wild out the one who got beat by Bush. Does not fight on the post move. Stays at home, gets outside, and makes the interception. The ball just hung up a little too long. You see Pear Larson held it a little longer than he would like to. Throws the ball high and wide. Wild Rap reacts nicely, makes the interception. So the Wall Rap with the INT. And Yale with the lead, 17-14, 7.40 to play. 7.40 left of the football game, Yale 17, Cornell 14. Mark Walrap was wearing that shield to guard his eye. He got injured in the UConn game when John Likaretsis, the right tackle, tried to give him a high five and missed. And therefore, he had to miss two games with an eye bleed. He's back wearing the shield, and he just picked up that big interception. On third down. Yale taking over from their own 20, and nothing happening. Running the football, Keith Price maybe got a yard on the play. And now, once again, Cornell has to turn to their defense to give the offense an opportunity. Yeah, they'll need it again. The offense had a good drive, but just when they got down there close, couldn't convert. And I want the near side of the field. Down here to the wide side. On second down, Hendrickson runs the option. And he gets close to a first down, picking up six yards. It'll bring up a third down. And three. Zerkowitz, 27, strong safety. He must have a cramp. He's tight in that hamstring. The trainer stretching out his hamstring. He's always the defensive coordinator continuing to work the signs. Has he had a busy day? Right. It, it seems like the defense has been on the field quite a bit today. Third and three at the 27. Roll out to the wide side of the field. Henry Kidd pitches out. Price is going to throw it. He throws the option pass and is caught. A tremendous grab by Dave Provilla with three men draped all over him. And the 6'4 tight end comes down with the pigskin and a first down. That's the fourth time that Yale has run that play this season. They run it more than anybody else. Price throws it. Usually when you got a halfback option, you tell the guy, if he's not wide open, don't throw it. But Price throws it often enough that they let him throw it into a crowd, and Provilla just makes a nice catch, like you said, Bruce. Decent throw there, too, by the tailback. He threw it like a loaf of bread. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't zipped in there, but it was it was in the right place. In motion goes Aaron on first down. Nelson replacing Price in the backfield. Following Sturhan and Giselle on the right side. Picking up three. Getting near the midfield line. And the tackle made by Steve Buss. With some help from Brian Draga. 542 to play. 17-14 Yale and for Cornell this no doubt a crucial football game in their quest for the Ivy League crown. They have one loss going in. They've got Columbia and Kane still to play. This is a game they felt they had to win. Hand off Nelson. Nelson gets to the 47 of Cornell. Draga made the stop. Yale's rushing attack today has been pretty good. And it's been both Price and Nelson contributing. As we come up on five minutes to play. Look at Nelson's numbers. Two touchdowns, 118 yards. He's a senior, mechanical engineering major. He's had a good, solid season. Third and four. Henry to the throw, fires. It is incomplete. Nick Baumbach was all over Nelson. And it brings up a fourth down. And Yale will send on their punting unit. Boy, once again, in a big play, Cornell comes with a blitz, putting their defensive backs in single coverage. And Baumbach does a good job. See the blitz come out of your left side of your screen. You'll see the linebackers. Man-to-man -man coverage. Baumbach right on the money on the out pattern. Look at Iwan concentrating on the football and doing enough to keep Baumbach from catching the ball on the pop-up. But good effort by number 17. Jay Waller will punt. Chris Allen drops back deep. Allen waits for it in his own 10. Allen has some room. He's got the ball, gets to the 15, spins to the 20-yard line, and a fine return by Allen, who gets to the 22. Kenna Heffernan made the stop. 
4.30 left in the football game. Cornell with the ball, down by three. 4.30 left in the ball game. Yale 17, Cornell 14. Bruce Beck and Kevin Guthrie with you from the Yale Bowl. Air Larson brings down the offensive unit as Cornell takes over at their own 22 in a familiar pattern having to come from behind to win a football game. Single setback is Levin. And on first down, Levitt gets the handoff and goes nowhere. Dropped for a three-yard loss. Cornell came from behind to beat Dartmouth 17-14. A winning score with 49 seconds left. 97-yard drive to do it. Against Bucknell, they won 29-28. Winning score with 11 seconds to go. And against Harvard, an 18-13 thriller. Winning score with a minute six left. They're forced to come from behind again today. Second down. Loose football. And Yale comes up with it. John Lickerexis recovers the ball at the 20-yard line of Cornell. See what happened inside here. Just looked like in that, in the center quarterback exchange just just didn't happen. Something happened inside, and, and the ball just went down to the ground immediately. Something between 64 Bladorn and his quarterback Per Larson, the ball went on the floor. So turnovers, which played Cornell last week against Brown, once again a problem here today. Yale with the ball at the Cornell 20. First and 10, 3:53 to play, and on first down, Nelson goes nowhere. Good play by Garrett Garney, number 21. The strong safety came flying into the backfield, turned the play inside, and then made the tackle. As you see the clock, which is obviously a factor. Garrett Garney with a nice tackle on the outside for Cornell. Seth Payne also in on the stop. Yale looking to snap a four-game losing streak, not only this season, but against Cornell. They haven't beaten them since 1989. Second down and 10. From the 20, in motion goes Aaron. Handoff to Nelson. And Bob Nelson is stopped by John Matulo and company. Wagner also in on the stop at the 16-yard line. Garrett Gardy is always a part of that triumvirate in the pile. And a timeout third and five, and a timeout taken. So we have three minutes and nine seconds left in this fourth quarter of play. Yale holding on to a 17-14 lead and driving. Welcome back to the Yale Bowl. The situation, 3.09 left to play. Third down and five for Yale at the Cornell 16-yard line. And the Bulldogs leading 17-14. What do you look for here, Kevin? I think a rollout. I think they'll try to get uh, Chris Evans in the break contain. They're going from the shotgun. I think they'll roll him out to the left side. Hand off. Wide open running attack is Nelson. He's at the 10, the 5. Touchdown. Out of the shotgun, the inside handoff to Nelson. And he's got his third TD of the day. Shows what I know, right? Inside handoff, late developing play. Good call. Excellent run by Nelson. Yeah, good call. His third touchdown of the ball game, as you said, Bruce. Good call by Yale. And with 3.02 to play, a chance for the Bulldogs here to go up by 10. Is good. Yale 24. Cornell 14 with 302 left in the football game. Here's the play. 28 on the right side. Inside handoff out of shotgun. Good blocking on the left side. Nelson just outruns guarded to the outside. Just basically outran him. And good blocking downfield as Knopf is late to make the play. You see the linebackers react up front. It's a little bit of a hold there on Wagner, but it was a good block. 
created the touchdown. 139 yards, three touchdowns for senior Bob Nelson. We'll take a short break. Well, Yale has opened up the lead to 24-14. Bob Nelson with three TDs in the day, 139 yards. Catching that quick drive following the Cornell fumble. And now John Lafferty set the kick off with not much time left. Cornell needs two scores to tie and two scores to win if they happen to get a two-point conversion. Not an easy one. Lafferty kicking off. Victor Borges waits for the ball at the seven. Borges to the ten. Cuts back and gets maybe to the 12 or 15 yard line. And he is tackled. Let's go back for a moment to that last sequence. Watching this play on the touchdown play, Keena Heffernan, number 29, will come up to make a block on Wagner. See that left arm? He could have gotten called for a hold there. He didn't. He sprung a touchdown. It was a pretty good block. Had the referee been on the other side of Wagner, you might have seen a holding call there that prevented the touchdown, but a great effort by Nelson. From the 17 is where Cornell will put it and play up first down. Carol Larson forced to run to the pocket. He's got some room. He's across the 30, and he goes out of bounds at the 35-yard line. Excellent effort by Larson, not only to get the yards, but also to end up getting out of bounds and stopping the clock. They got a lot of work to do, but that's good yardage on first down for Cornell. An 18-yard pickup by Larson. I tell you, these guys never quit. It's not impossible. It's not impossible for them to come back. They obviously need a bit of a miracle, a big play here early. Cornell with two timeouts left. Larson throws incomplete. Ball intended for Aaron Berryman, but underthrown. What I always find, or I found as a receiver, when you got late in a game like this and you absolutely had to pass the ball, it was always easier to throw the ball across the middle. You always had bigger lanes, and it was more open if you sent guys dragging across the middle, both short and long. That's what you need to do to get the ball upfield in a late, in a late drive like this. Shulman and Beardy go wide to the right. Three wide outs on the field. Larson to throw, being pressured, and he throws incomplete. And a flag is down on the play. The ball was intended for Ryan Masterson, the fullback. That was a smart play. I, I think we'll wait to see what the call was. It was a smart play by Larson. He was getting tackled. He threw the ball away. But the call is a hold, so it had nothing to do with intentionally grounding the football because he had a receiver right where he threw it. Yeah, the flag went down right near the receiver. You see Jim Hoffer yelling at the officials. It was a, it was, it was a lineman up in front of the play who got called for the hold. How can that be? They were holding the receiver! And uh, Jim Hopper yelling that they were holding the receiver. How can you call it against the offensive group? As Art Fellows has to march 10 off against the Big Red. They were holding So the ball goes back to the 22. Loosen up, loosen up. And Hopper not pleased with that one no, at all. No, no, nor should he be, but... The whole call was probably called on a lineman up the field as opposed to the receiver. But a tough call for Cornell in any event, second and a million. Second and 24. Larson, pressured again. Throwing along for Berryman. He's out there. He's got him at the 30. And Berryman is down to the 24-yard line. A gorgeous throw by Per Larson. Mark Walrath, who had the big interception against Berryman earlier in the quarter, was the man who got beat on this play. I tell you, these guys just never quit. This is a great throw because he just launched it out there way in front of Berryman. Walrath does a good job of making the tackle, but he was way late on the play. Berryman makes a nice catch. Big, big play for Cornell. Berryman always in position to make those big catches. The pitch back to Levitt. The ball is loose. Still loose, and Levitt has to eat it at the 30-yard line. That pitch play, which has been a source of discontent in recent weeks. That time, an option play, and it was kind of messed up by the defender right in Perry Larson's face. They're going with no huddle. Second down, 15 at the 30. Larson has time. Larson throwing for Berryman. Incomplete. No flag on 
the coverage Rob Masella. Wow, Berryman almost had a, had a play on that ball because late in the play, you kind of see Berryman bump into the defender and, and sort of push off, and he gets himself some separation. He actually has a chance to catch this ball. Watch number one. Masala's in front of him. He kind of pushes off, and then he's got a chance to catch it. You see, it went right through his hands. It would have been a tough catch, but boy, Berryman had a chance to have a touchdown there. Third down, 15 at the 30. Draw to Levitt, and he is stopped dead in his tracks and actually loses four yards. John Licaretsis made the tackle, and it brings up a fourth down and 18 yards to go. Isaiah Wilson, number 95, also right in there to make the play. Great, you know, he's not even on the two deep. Isaiah Wilson comes in on the football field and does a super job making a play down there on a draw play. That's what Dave Kelly, the line coach of Yale, saying to him right there. That's a huge play. Cornell tried to catch Yale by surprise. See, he, Cornell knew that they were going to go for it on fourth down. And that influences the call you make on third and long. Because, you know, while you'd like to get the first down, if you can get 12 of the 15 yards, you're in position to get a first down on fourth down. So they try to take a gamble, go with the draw play, and try to get as much as they could with their best player, Chad Levitt, and it got stopped by Isaiah Wilson. And that play has worked on many occasions. It is fourth and 18, ball at the 33. Cornell must go for it, trailing by 10, a minute 47 to play. Typically, Cornell's favorite play to run in this situation. They hope for zone defensive coverage, and they send all four of their wide receivers straight down the field. It's called all goes. You try to get four guys in the seams of the zone and find the right guy. See all the four wide receivers? They'll probably go straight down the field. Back to throw. Larson steps in. He throws for Birke. Incomplete at the goal line. And Yale will take over on down. Difficult situation to execute well. Fourth and long is very tough. Berkey number 80 in the lower part of your screen is just going to run a takeoff from the inside, actually, going up the sideline. Zone coverage, double coverage by Yale. Good coverage downfield. No way Bjerke could make the catch. Berserkowitz was on him. Bjerke made a good effort. Yale takes over at their own 34. Cornell, Cornell never quit. They had a nope. chance to score a touchdown. Aaron Berryman had a chance on one. Their effort today, once again, has been better than their execution. And that has been a, a story in the last two weeks. Yeah, they just really hit a dry spell in the second quarter today. And it's not enough. Not enough in Yale capitalized on the big plays when they needed to. Cornell spells a timeout here with the minute 36 to play, and they have one timeout left. Let's take a look at the other scores in the Ivy. Brown leading Harvard late in the fourth, 23-17, looking to improve the two and three in the league. Harvard's two and two going in. Dartmouth at home leading Columbia. So Columbia trying to get over the 500 mark for the first time since 71. That is in danger. And the Penn Princeton game now, Pennsylvania, is rolling. 33 to 12 over Princeton in the fourth. Penn looking for their 19th straight win. Two, two plays are going to key to this football game in the second half. The first one is Aaron Berryman running the quarter route. Perry Larson tries to throw it, maybe force it into the end zone, an interception for Yale in the end zone. The second one is the missed center quarterback exchange, turnover, which Yale turned into a touchdown. Those two plays prevented Cornell from winning this football game. And off, and going straight ahead is Pete Price, gets a few yards. Not continuing to wind down. I want to thank Dave Wallheater, the SID at Cornell, Steve Kahn, Sports Information Director at Yale, and all the guys who helped us today for the booth. Tom Sylvester, our spotter. Jim Ross, the guy stats. Bo Lintz, our stage manager. All uh, young men from Yale. 
with outstanding future possibilities in the TV industry. <laughs> well, you know, the one thing they did a really good job of today is they all, they all go to Yale, a couple of them basketball players, Tom's a, a football player with an injury. They did a good job of not making any noise up here. I know it's tough when you're rooting for a team and you're watching the game not to get excited. They did none of that. Good look at Bob Nelson as it's fourth down and Yale will have to punt it away. Nelson with three touchdowns of the day. Also want to thank my research assistant, Jonathan Beck, for some real strong work at home this week. <laughs> Is Jonathan like five years old? No, or he's eight. Oh, sorry, eight. Now that, sorry, Jonathan. Now that he can read, it is a huge... That just shows positive. the positive. That just shows the quality of your research. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's a family activity. <laughs> 15 seconds left in the ball game, and a penalty will be called here against Yale for delay of game, which will stop the clock. Now, I think I think what Yale did was, was take it down. Oh, I thought they took it down in the last second of the time out. Marcosa <laughs> looking for another victory. He, he looks happy, doesn't he? <laughs> he told me he's not taking the losses any better. It doesn't look like he's taking the wins any better. He is 12th on the active list in Division I in terms of wins. And looking to chalk up another and break this four-game losing streak for Yale. Chris Howler watches the punt. Bounce all the way down to the Cornell 18-yard line with one second left. And that is it. Well, it's not it. They're going to have to come up and line up because there was one second. Now we got fans on the field. But they actually have to come out and snap the football in order to end this game. So they'll have to get the fans off the field with one second on the clock. You know, there's not a fan on the field that's taller than about 3'9". Yeah. <laughs> it's going to be tough to get those kids off. So the Big Red of Cornell will drop to 3-2 and two in the league. And Yale will approve to 2-3 and three in the league. Penn will be 5-0 and all with their win today. And Penn will have a two-game lead with two games to play in the Ivy. Penn will play Harvard at home next week. And then they play the finale at Cornell. Cornell, what they have to hope for at this point is a victory next week at Columbia. A Penn loss to Harvard and then a victory over Penn at Ithaca in the finale of the year, and that all is a very tall order at this point. Larson will air it out the final play of the game, barring the penalty. It is intercepted, and that will do it. So the Yale Bulldogs beat the Big Red of Cornell 24 to 14 at the Yale Bowl. We'll be back with more in a moment. At West Peck and Greer, we believe sound investing begins with education and innovation. West Peck and Greer believes by supporting education, we can help investors be successful and our country be competitive. West Peck and Greer, quality investments for individuals and institutions. West Peck and Greer, investing in a vital America. Why shouldn't you just ask us? It's not like we don't know anything about the environment. Kids care a lot about their world and where they live right now. I think everybody should recycle more. They can use it again and again and again. America's forest and paper people are listening. With your help, we now recover 40% of America's paper for recycling, and we're committed to 50% by the year 2000. America's forest and paper people, improving tomorrow's environment today. Cornell University. First in discovery, service, and leadership. After graduation, no matter which path you choose, you'll find that your Cornell degree makes an extraordinary difference in your life. The university is the unbreakable link that binds all Cornellians together. An intangible, elusive, almost indefinable tie that will be with you all of your life. Cornell University. Creating the future. When I told him my taxes were killing me, my broker recommended Lord Abbott and Company. The firm's been around since 1929 and manages over $16 billion. I made an investment decision. Since then, I've been receiving monthly dividends free of income tax. Dividends I can share with my family, not the state and federal governments. I'm pleased my broker found Lord Abbott and Company for me. Maybe it's time to talk with your financial advisor or call Lord Abbott and Company at 1-800-426-1130. 
Cornell Football on Prime has been brought to you by GTE. It's amazing what we can do together. By Cadillac and your Cadillac dealer, creating a higher standard. By Weiss Peck and Greer, quality investments for individuals and institutions. And by the Kiplinger Washington Letter. Back at the Yale Bowl in New Haven, Connecticut, where the Bulldogs have beaten the Big Red 24 to 14. And a solid all-around game for the Yale Bulldogs as they snap a four-game losing streak. Next week, the Cornell Big Red travels to New York City to take on the Lions of Columbia. Check your local listings for the time of that broadcast in your area. You'll see it next week on Prime. So Yale wins it 24 to 14. Carm Koza gets his 173rd career win. He took over the helm of the Yale program when Vince Lombardi was leading the Green Bay Packers, and he's still going strong. For Kevin Guthrie, I'm Bruce Beck saying so long from the Yale Bowl.